Yankee Stadium in New York, where the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees tangle in the second game of the three-game series. Light breeze blowing from left to right, temperature in the high 70s, a lovely day for baseball. Hi, everybody. I'm Vin Scully, along with Joe Garagiola. Welcome to Yankee Stadium. And for the umpteenth time, it would appear, we come on the air talking about the fact it looks like the Yankees are dead. Isn't that the truth? In Anaheim, uh, we saw the Friday night game. They blew, and then Saturday, a blowout. We said, well, that's it. It's over. We go to Boston. Boston takes charge. We say, well, it's over. And it looks like it's over after yesterday's game, but... Who knows? Well, we do know that hope burns eternal, but we also know that the Yankees are getting closer to the coroner's office because time is running out. They've lost four straight to the Red Sox, who have beaten them eight out of 11, and suddenly the magic number for the Yankees is five. For Milwaukee and Detroit, it's four. And all you have to do is visit both benches, and you know where they stand in the standings. It was a sloppy game last night, but what was important, the Red Sox beat the Yankees 10 to 9, and so that's the act atmosphere a superbly confident Red Sox team against a Yankee team that in its heart and soul must know it is really hurting if not terminal Wade Boggs will start it off if you plan to keep score we'll give you the names very slowly so you can write them down Wade Boggs who has a sore instep on his right foot so he is the designated hitter today and as usual he takes a pitch for a strike Boggs leading off in over 80 games and has reached more than 50 percent of the time. So he's also an ideal leadoff man. And on the box watch at 689 plate appearances he swung at the first pitch only 42 times. Ball two two and one. Unbelievable. He just takes it all the time. You wonder if the pitchers in the American League are able to capitalize on that at all by throwing it right down the pipe. Except that when you think that he might be taking it in the late innings, he's jump on it and tear out a row of seats for you. So it works for him, obviously. Leading the league at 363, being pursued by Kirby Puckett. Ball three. Puckett, by the way, is nine points behind Boggs, and it's interesting. Kirby is having such a tremendous year. He might wind up with the highest batting average in the American League for a right hand batter since Joe DiMaggio in 1939. And that might be overlooked. Remember now, right hand batter. Puckett is hitting 354 going into this, this day. Three and two, the count to Wade Boggs. And he's aboard on a low curve. Here the way the Red Sox stack up now as Boggs opens up with a walk. Marty Barrett will be at second base. And it'll be Dwight Evans in right field. Mike Greenwell in left. Todd Benzinger at first. Ellis Burks in center field. Jody Reed batting seventh at short. Rich Gedman the catcher. And Ed Romero will be at third base. Boggs fouled a ball off his instep of the right foot Tuesday. He can run straight, but it pains him to turn. He's on at first base, not really a base stealing threat. Marty Barrett lifts one foul off third, heading for the grandstand and out of play. Right hand to Richard Dotson on the mound, and Dotson has been Jekyll and Hyde. He started the year five wins and no losses. Since then, he is six and nine, so he comes in with that record, 11 and nine. He has a respectable record at home. He is six and three here at Yankee Stadium. He's been plagued by the home run ball. He's given up 26 home runs. Although he has beaten the Red Sox, it was not exactly an artistic victory. He got credit for a 12-6 win, even though he was unable to hold on to a seven to nothing lead. So Richard Dotson working on Marty Barrett, and the count, no balls and one strike. You know, that's one thing you can say about this Yankee ball club, Ben. They score runs. They just can't hold leads. In fact, in Dotson's victories, they've scored almost eight runs a game for him. Line drive into center field for a base hit. Boggs to second holding there. So Richard Dotson, who once upon a time was considered one of the outstanding pitchers in the American League, and he has really fallen upon lean time. 
You know, when you talk about Dotson, Dotson was superb in 1983. He was 22 and 7 that year. In 1984, he was on the All Star team. And he was traded from a non contender, the Chicago White Sox of the Yankees, and he's been a big disappointment. So he's in the soup now, first and second, nobody out. And Dwight Evans coming up with a little six game hitting streak. Dwight Evans, a thorough professional, was giving Rack Slider, the third base coach, a long look in case he wanted to flash a sign. But there's no play on here. I guarantee you just knock those runs in. Little number back to the box. Dotson has to go to first base, and the runners move up 90 feet as Boggs advances to third and Barrett to second. The so one out, runners at second and third, and the batter will be Mike Greenwell with a little four game hitting streak. And a heavy heart uh, to the extent, Vin, he was home visiting his dad. His dad had a heart attack. Uh, Leonard uh, Greenwell is in a hospital. And Mike said he's going to turn around and go right back. And his father told his brother, you tell Mike to stay there and get some base hits. And we know at Fort Myers he's watching the game. And as they intentionally walk him, we uh, certainly wish him speedy recovery because this youngster, I tell you, has had a tremendous year and very close to his dad. But he's thinking about him today and we want him to know that. So in a moment, the bases will be loaded with one out. And Todd Benzinger will be coming up. So Mike Greenwell getting the intentional walk. Benzinger waiting his turn on deck. The Red Sox have beaten the Yankees four straight, eight out of 11. Joe Morgan has seen his team play 20 games above 500 since he picked up the reins. The Sox are 44 and 24 under Joe's direction. They have a five game lead. And they are 21 games over 500 for the year. So it's been a big story for the Boston Red Sox. Ben Dodson, obviously, as we look at Pinella, is in a big jam because so early in the ball game, he really has not thrown that many pitches. He, to this point, guarantee you doesn't know what his best pitch is. And if I'm Benzinger, I'm looking for a fastball to try to uh, jump on it because he'll want to get ahead of you. And he has not thrown curveballs. He's not been able to change up. Uh, he's barely gotten to the mound. Benzinger is a switch hitter and he has much better numbers as a left handed batter. He's hitting 275 from this side of the plate. Big off speed pitch for a strike. Going one to Todd Benzinger. And that was a good pitch for Dotson because you got to believe that Benzinger was looking for the heater to get ahead and Dotson was able to show he's still a pretty good pitcher with that pitch. Benzinger very good in the clutch. He's hitting over 400 with the bases loaded this year. One ball and one strike. So. Dotson had really slowed up. Benzinger looking at a slow hook and now a straight change in the count one and one with Greenwell Barrett and Boggs out on the line. Just the start of the ball game. The Red Sox really trying to put the Yankees away early. Ground ball to the right side off the glove of Willie Randolph. He's going to get the out at first and everybody moves up as Boggs brings in the run and the Red Sox lead one to nothing. As Willie was thinking, get the man at second base. You see, he was ready to turn, but now he knows he's lost that play. I doubt if he'd have gotten the uh, double play, but he was able to recover and at least get the man at first. So Benzinger picks up the RBI, and now with first base open, Ellis Burks, the batter. Burks is hit in eight out of 11. One nothing Boston here in the first inning. Two out. Fastball, 0 and 1. The Red Sox looking more and more now like the winners in the American League East. There is one jarring note for them, however. One ball, one strike. The division leaders, the other three, are excellent on the road. The Mets are seven games above 500 on the road. Oakland 18 games above 500 on the road the Dodgers 19 games above 500 on the road and the Sox are seven games under 500 on the road. That's one reason why they went to Oakland and couldn't win a game. They were 0 and 6 in Oakland this year. One and one to Ellis Burks. Ball two.
Two and one to Ellisburg's Jody Reed on deck. It's one nothing Boston and the chairs are barely warm here as Reed pumps the wood and waits. Two and two. Red Sox winning a scramble last night. So the Yankees take a lead. The Sox take a 5-3 lead. The Yankees come back and take a 9-5 lead. And the Sox never quit and wound up winning it with three in the ninth inning. 10-9. Two balls and two strikes. Fastball got him. So the Sox get one run, one hit, and lead two. And at the end of half an inning, one nothing Boston. The Yankees find themselves down one nothing before they go to the wood. It'll be Ricky Henderson in left field and Claudel Washington in center. Don Mattingly at first base and Dave Winfield in right. The designated hitter Jack Clark. Mike Pagliarulo at third. Willie Randolph at second. The catcher is Don Slaught and the shortstop is Rafael Santana. And trying to stop that lineup is Mike Bodiger with a record of 12 and 15. But since he came to the Red Sox, he is six and three. Nine of his last 11 starts have been quality starts. So he has been a definite plus for Boston. You stop to think that oil cam Boyd had to go out with the injury. What a job Boddicker has done. In fact, you look at the two starters today, the Red Sox acquiring Boddicker, the Yankees getting Dotson, and it has been Boddicker who has done the job and Dotson who has struggled. Terry Kennedy who caught Bodiger over at Baltimore talks about that Bodiger can adjust better than any pitcher he's seen if he doesn't have a pitch to get a hitter out he'll invent one whatever that means <laughs> tough to call <laughs> strike one and two you put down a question mark that's how you cross your fingers and say throw it he changes speeds well and he's around that plate Bodiger in his career here at Yankee Stadium is three and five. He beat Rick Roden here when he was pitching for Baltimore. Check swing and a slow roll at his shortstop. In a hurry is Jody Reed and Henderson in there with his landing gear down. That's a big, big play. Joe Morgan's going to come out and argue to play. I tell you, Henderson, uh, when he does things like that, he's telling everybody in the ballpark, especially the people on the bench, hey, this thing is not over. He takes a Pretty good swing, then stops it right at the uh, as he got across the plate, like the ball broke at the last minute. But here's the thing that really makes it, and I'm telling you, he was out. So Henderson is given credit for the squibber to first. It goes as a base hit. The thing that probably helped Henderson, and you saw it, is that check swing. It is very hard for an infielder to react on a check swing and Reed had to pause for that split second when it paid off for Henderson at first base when he started back so far it looked like the home run swing and then he got to the plate like at the last minute the ball broke and, and that's when he checks it because you start with that big swing and Reed really had to wait sure so Henderson now has hit an eight straight Ricky is also in a base stealing mode he needs a couple as he stands at first base. Henderson with 86 stolen bases. He takes a three and a half step lead off first base and he just accelerates right now. Claudel Washington went over two after entering last night's game as a pinch hitter. He has failed to hit in his last 12 at bats. 0 oh and 1. Bigger lead. That's the biggest bigger lead you watch him usually is three and a half off first four and a half off second base. He had a four step lead. Uh, if you're watching him as a catcher. You're marking that down. No balls and one strike to Claudel. Half. And pitch they out. pitch out. When you think about stolen base you think of Henderson of course. But this year you also think of Claudel Washington and that electrifying steal of home he pulled off against. Roger Clemens at Fenway. 
Henderson has gone back to the bag almost casually as if he can read Bodica that well. He's taken a pretty good sized lead and just going back in standing up and that usually tells you you can take another step. There he goes fouled away so they play hit and run and the count one and two and Washington had the right idea because Cubbing was the shortstop Reed the big hole there he was going to go that way. So Henderson will go back to first. Ricky set a new all time Yankee record for career stolen bases and with 86 that's the second highest single season total in Yankee history. His own record 1986 he stole 87. And he also had 80 steals in 1985. You have a game like you had last night somebody's got to make something happen and Henderson is the perfect guy to manufacture the run. Red Sox leading one nothing. And he has to dive back so that you know is as far as he can go. He was he was leaning ready to go now again you can almost count his steps. He'll tell you it's public knowledge. It's, it's usually three and a half, but you can see him lean right there. He's got ideas of going. Green, I think another step. Boy, it's a big lead. He's got him. Oh, that's the biggest lead that he's had. Here comes Joe Morgan again. He's having trouble. Watch him. That. That really was a case of too big a lead. He's lucky he got back. Yes, he did. Let's see where he tags it. He tagged him high. From that angle, I'd call him safe. Yeah, his hand was on. The tag was at the armpit. Armpit high. Joe Morgan tried to call it from the dugout and really was not in position. Where Joe certainly had grounds to argue when Henderson did the belly whopper to beat it. He really didn't have that much on that pickoff play and he said something to Henderson I wonder what he said to Ricky because Ricky was talking to him about it one and two the count of Claudel Washington it's one nothing Boston in a rather busy first inning and Henderson trying to shake up the Sox. He's still after him. I think what he's, he did on that lead at least been getting a big lead and at the first move going back to first base. It's really a one way lead, but he is determined to steal the base. One and two the count. Uh, Claudel Washington, bottom of the first inning. Henderson trying to steal number 87. Off speed. That would have been a dandy to be going on. But he, he caught Henderson between hitches much like you do a batter. Henderson was not ready. He was not uh, he was not tense enough to really take off. It wasn't a quick pitch but it was right at the borderline. Two balls and two strikes. Now he's ready. Hey, that's a pretty good battle going on there. It really is. If nothing else Henderson is at least taking some of the concentration away from body care in regards to Washington. It's also a little tough on Washington because throws to first that one time they put a play on it eats away at the hitters concentration although it hasn't affected Claudel with a 318 average but it's like a, a bulldog pulling on your shirt. Fouled away. I just wonder if Henderson that last dive didn't hurt himself a little bit though. He's got his head down right now and he didn't take that big aggressive lead that he did. But then again from past experience you just don't believe anything you see at first base because he may look like he's ready for the intensive care unit and he'll steal two bases on you. There he goes. There he goes. Check swing. Another check down to Reed who juggled throws. Got him anyway. I and now Pinello will argue. I think Joe Morgan's two visits out there paid off because that's what Pinello is saying. He comes out to argue. Now you change. Boy, what a first inning oh. for Rocky Rowe, the first base umpire. Another check swing and a juggle by Reed, but they still nip Washington. You can see they start that big swing and that ball moves just enough for them to stop and 
The check swing makes it tough, and Reed was breaking to cover second base with Henderson going, makes the throw. I couldn't tell on that angle. I'll tell you what caused the trouble, too. Washington couldn't react. We were talking about how the shortstop doesn't react on a check swing. If you go back to the start of that tape, you'll see the ball is well away from home plate. And Claudel Washington is still standing in the batter's box because he was all wound up. Well, it was inside. He tried to swing and he kind of turned. And he just couldn't break. If he's able to break right now, he beats it out. So here is Mattingly trying to pick up the tying run. He went three for four last night, including his 15th home run of the year. He hit it against Bruce Hurst. For Mattingly, it was his first home run since the 3rd of September. Ball one. So he's opened up his stance a little bit, too. That right foot is pulled back a little bit more than we saw in Boston last week. Mattingly at 308, two of the league's premier hitters on display here today. Wade Boggs, who is the designated hitter today, and Don Mattingly, the first baseman. Mattingly's run production from home runs has fallen off considerably from last year, but there's one big reason. Last year, he hit four grand slams. Check swing. Boy, you talk about bad checks. So Mattingly holds up. That means Boddicker is really fooling the Yankee hitter. That ball is moving more than they expect because you, the good hitter, you don't see it very often, and Mattingly's certainly a good hitter. That ball is just moving a lot more than they expect. So we've had three check swings in the first inning. And a runner at third with two out. And Dave Winfield, a batter. By the way, in talking about Mattingly's run production, we said he had four slams. Make it six last year. Here's Winfield. And he has really been the out man for Boston pitching of late. He has just three hits and 22 RBIs. And he couldn't buy a key base hit last night. In fact, had Winfield done anything offensively, the Yankees might very well have won last evening. The big slow curveball for a strike. Seven runners left on. He came up at one spot with a double play with the bases loaded. Now he has a runner at third, the tying run with two out. One nothing Red Sox, first inning. Of a roundhouse breaking ball. One ball, one strike. Sidearm in the Henderson has worked his way over to third base. Winfield not only 0 for 5 last night, he's 0 for 10 in his last two games. One ball, one strike. Ball two. You might. Remember that he was excused from the game of the 20th to be with his ailing mother. So Dave Winfield, big man, asked to carry a big load. He has 106 RBIs, 25 home runs. Henderson at third, two out, two balls, one strike. Ball three. Well, you know, with Claudel Washington stealing home against Clemens, you can see that both Boddicker and Gedman really given Henderson a pretty good look at third base because you just can't take anything for granted. Three and one to Winfield. On deck is the designated hitter, Jack Clark. So the slow breaking ball puts him aboard. And Boddicker now goes head to head with Jack Clark. Clark won for five last night. He got a bouncing single up the middle with the bases loaded to drive in two. He's been hitting the ball pretty hard of late. In fact, in his last four games, he has two home runs, eight runs batted in, and hitting 500. So he's pretty hot. On the strength of the way he pitched Winfield, you would think that Bodiger will try to get Clark out with something besides the fastball. First and third, two out on the first inning. Big slow breaking ball. 0 and 1. Winfield doesn't do a lot of running, but he's stolen 8 out of 12. And of course, the big man is Henderson at third. Two down, first inning. 1 0 Boston. Another slow curveball for a strike. 
Clark might have to put an ad in the paper to get a fastball in this spot. 0 and 2. He might get it, but if it's in the strike zone, it'll definitely be a mistake. And another slow curve hit right into the Red Sox dugout. Not only was it a slow curve, he came from the side. I mean, and uh, what that does is hopefully you'll have the hitter give some ground and then hit that outside corner where the target was. But he got that ball in the strike zone. If you're going to miss, you better miss away from the plate, get inside. You might be in trouble. No balls and two strikes. Fastball just a showcase pitch, one and two. A moment ago, you had a fleeting glimpse of a young man in the Sox dugout fielding that foul ball. That's a glimpse of the future. That's Carlos Quintana. And they feel he's ready to play next year. Well, Morgan used him in a spot last week in Boston. Bases loaded. He drew a base on balls. First time at batting the big leagues. One and two to Clark. Off speed and hit foul off his foot. Right down on Jack's left foot. So it's still one ball, two strikes. If you joined us late in the first inning, Dotson got in trouble on a walk to Boggs and a single by Barrett with the bases loaded. Benzinger grounded out to pick up the RBI. And here in the bottom of the first, Henderson, a check swing single, a couple of ground balls moved him to third, Winfield walk, and here's Clark trying to at least get the Yankees even. One ball, two strikes. <laughs> Off speed, pop foul to the left of the plate. Gedman coming back will not have a play. Still one and two. You know, you might notice a lot of times Gedman patting the right side of his leg. A lot of times what that is is a, a an indicator as to which signal they're using. I mean, by that, uh, I pat my leg. It could be the second one, uh, flash I give. If I don't, it's the first flash, that kind of thing. He has been doing it just intermittently. One and two, the count to Jack Clark. Fastball got him looking. Talk about setting somebody up, huh? After all the slow curves, he drilled him with the express. In the second inning with the Red Sox leading the Yankees one to nothing, it'll be Jody Reed, Rich Gedman, and then Ed Romero. Watching Don Slot make that throw to second Jody base Reed. between innings, uh, Vin, he really threw that ball hard and came out of his cross like somebody was running because last night with men at first and third, Pinella made a move where he brought in Skinner from the bullpen and what a tough spot for Skinner and I don't think that's number one on your popularity parade uh, as far as slot is concerned. Very tough maneuver oh, one you'd tough. rarely see to switch a catcher in that kind of a spot. I never had it happen to me and I can't think of anybody that happened to. And if it never happened to you it didn't happen to anybody. <laughs> what do you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> One ball and no strikes. It was just such a setup. You know, you put that thing on a tee, I'm gonna hit it. Wanna know to Ellis Reed. What a nice what a nice guy. It's true, it's true. Jody Reed had only 70 at bats by the end of June. And he has now become a mainstay for the Sox at shortstop. One and one to Jody. Roger Angel just a great writer has a great description of Jody Reed. He's got such a young face except with that mustache. He looks like a kid going out on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Two and one to Jody. Well, he's no kid with that bat since the All Star break. He's hit over 340. Whenever the Red Sox come to Yankee Stadium, particularly, it really turns a memory book loose on ball four to Jody Reed. The Dotson has already walked three men. But you know, since the Babe Ruth trade, Boston to New York, and of course it's appropriate, we're in the house that Ruth built. This could very well be, if the Red Sox win the division, it'll be the first time that they've won two years so close together. Remember, they won in 86. There's the, the Bambino. So winning in 86, and they're trying to win in 88. That's hit down the left field line, slicing as she goes foul and out of play. The point we want to make the Sox, since the Babe Ruth trade, won four times 1946, 67, 75, and 86. Since the trade, 
after the 1919 season the Yankees won 22 World Series and the Red Sox none. And just to rub salt in the wound. Who do you think holds a home run record for home runs by a visiting player at Fenway Park in one year. Uh huh. Babe Ruth with eight. Who holds the all time record for visiting home runs at Fenway Park. Mm hmm. Babe Ruth with 42. Well, it's pretty hard to see the Red Sox come to Yankee Stadium without thinking about the Babe. One ball one strike. We saw Gedman really take a long long look at Rack Slider and he's a double play man. And you just wonder they wouldn't put the ball in play. With Reed at first. Ball two two and one one thing about Gedman's presence Mike Boddicker has a very good record when Gedman is behind the plate. Boddicker's record with Gedman. Six wins and one loss. And there goes the runner. Hit and run chopper to the right side. Randolph lost a play at second, gets the out at first. So to avoid the double play, they turn Reed loose. And it's a simple 4 3 play. Gedman, by the way, had grounded into six double plays this year. Number 11. Get the ball. They count to two balls and one strike, and you really got the opposition in a box, and you can start your man. It might come as a surprise to you. The fellow who was grounded into the most double plays for the Boston Red Sox is one of the greatest hitters the game has ever known, Wade Boggs. He's hit into 22 double plays. Great save by Don Slaud. Ball one, one and zero. Oh. Of course, you have to be a really good hitter. To ground into double plays. The people who do it are, are the Boggs, the Rices, as you look at Wade. Ball hard, sure. And who holds the record for grounding into double plays? Henry Aaron. And what would you do? Would you bench any of those guys because they hit into double plays? I couldn't afford them. That's right. One ball and no strikes. One and one to Romero. Romero getting a chance to play third since Boggs has the sore instep. Richard Dodson. Extricated himself from serious trouble in the first inning, but gave up a run, and the Sox lead one nothing here in the second. One away. Two balls, one strike. Fastball hit down to shortstop. The play by Santana is just a flip toss as Reed takes third. Santana with bone chips in his right elbow. It's still up for grabs as to whether he will have surgery in the offseason or not. But every play is painful for him. And speaking about uh, having surgery, how about the edict that came down on Candelaria? You either have surgery or pitch. And then Candelaria saying that's great. They're going to force me having had knee problems to pitch and Al Leiter has missed three quarters of the year because of a blister and what else is new here. But he says there's no reflection on Leiter. No. Oh no. Not at all. Just happened to come to it's mind. Just like one happy family like in the old days Hawkins Falls. I was thinking as we see John sitting quietly in the corner of the bullpen. You know the ideal setup for this year. They should have made a trade just for this year at least to have George Steinbrenner run the Toronto Blue Jays. I mean you want to talk about oil and fire. You see where Lloyd Mosby, Mosby was taken out of a Jimmy game. Williams, yeah yeah they, they have some situation in Toronto. One and one to count to Boggs who walked and scored a run in the first inning. Well, he has a, a little four game streak. It's a real love nest up there. Isn't it? Mm. One and one. In there. You can see how the defense is playing Boggs as if he were a right handed batter Santana really protects the hole between short and third he's got a lot of room up the middle because Boggs his area is from center field to the left field line you get that ball inside he'll turn it on you and the first couple of pitches were sinkers and you know Boggs would go the other way with that kind of a pitch 
He pulls a little chopper and leaving the bag is Mattingly and he just got back to handle the throw from Randolph. So the Sox leave Reed at third. It's still one nothing Boston. Boniker had six call strikes one swinging strike four fouls he made 23 pitches six call strikes four fouls three put in play one swinging strike and nine balls that shows command which is in direct contrast to Dodson Ben the pitch for ball one to Mike Pagliarulo yeah it's amazing at least the the aura that the pitchers give off Boddicker of a winner and Dodson as if he really doesn't want to pitch and I'm sure that's not true but we're just talking about the feeling you get looking at them. It, it's almost like an umpire making a decision. He has to sell the call. A pitcher has to sell his feeling out there like, hey, it's my mound, my game. Two and one to count to Fagliarulo. Interesting decision by Lou Pinella in the big series in Boston when Bruce Hurst pitched. Pagliarulo did not play. And then last night, Lou opted to play Pagliarulo, and he hit a home run against Hurst. Fouled away. Two and two. Call it a hunch, whatever. Maybe he just liked the way he was swinging the bat in batting practice. But Patty Rulo was in there. He'd be followed by Willie Randolph and then Don Slaught. It's really been a bad year for Pags, hitting only 218. It's 1 0 Boston. We're in the bottom of the second. Two balls, two strikes. Slow curveball. Got him looking. Boy, you talk about a rainbow. And a pot of gold at the end of it. Not that Pagliarulo thinks so. They've been getting Pagliarulo with the breaking ball low and inside. He just changes speeds on this one. He throws what he calls a Fosh ball. And it's a, that big rainbow thing right there. And I tell you, that's what it is. Keeping the hitter's timing off. And Vodiker certainly has been able to do that. Pagliarulo doesn't believe it. And he comes right back with one to Randolph for a strike. And did, one you, one. did you see him duck it like it was going to hit him? That's how big it was. You can see Randolph flinch, and it's not a, a hard biting curveball. It's really a roundhouse. And another one. Well, he's really on target now. He's thrown three in a row, all for strikes. He has struck out two in a row. 0 oh 2 the count to Willie Randolph. I'll tell you, with that control, he'd break the man at the carnival. And he gives you a wrinkle away just for good measure. Remember what he did to Clark came back with the fastball on that outside part of the plate. Mike Boddicker he began his career with the Sox by pitching a shutout against Milwaukee just to keep matter there with that up and in fastball two and two. Boddicker the 31st of July is when he began his career with Boston shutting out Milwaukee 5 0. There's the fastball. Randolph late fouled it away. Two balls, two strikes to Willie. Randolph has had a tough year physically. Be on the DL a couple of times. And it hit him. Big curveball hit him just above the numbers. So Randolph plunked by the pitch with one out, and Don Slaught will be the batter. For Boddicker, he has hit 14 batters. He, that's the curveball he wanted to start at the batter, like he did the first strike, and it just didn't break. And you can see how upset he was. It's interesting that a fellow who throws so many big jugs, big slow curveballs, would have the most hit batters in the major leagues. Well, that because it's so slow if you're going to get hit you're not going to get pitch hit. to take that's right you, you don't want Nolan Ryan to take a shot at you <laughs> take about 20 calories out Bly Levin has hit 13 and Bodiger now 14 and here's Don Slaughter one ball and no strikes to Don you want to hang in there as long as you can with the curveball and sometimes like on that particular case it doesn't break so you get plunked really they, doesn't hurt you he's a good man to take one for the club <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Randolph goes the pitch behind slot dropped by Gedman. I he never had a play. I don't think he would have gotten him because he picked the perfect pitch to go. It was a straight steal. And slot was either going to have to throw it flat footed if he came up with it. And if he was going to make the play it would be on the release. Now Randolph not that big a jump but you see 
There he goes. Hit and run play. Look back. I thought it was a straight steal. Now look where it goes behind him and look at the position. Gedman just can't get can't, can't get rid of it. Eight out of 12 for Willie Randolph. So the Yankees again with the tying run and scoring position. Two balls and no strikes to count to Don Slaud and Rafael Santana on deck. We're in the second inning. They're not exactly hurrying. Sidearm fastball that got the outside corner. Two balls, one strike. Slot one for four last night. And he lifts one back a third. Romero with the shades down makes the play. Holding at second is Randolph, and that'll bring up Rafael Santana. Boy, Bodiger's another one of those pitchers, Ben, that if you had the radar gun and use that as your yardstick, you'd never sign into a contract. But what he does, he's around the plate, he's got control of his pitches, and he comes from different angles. That was a sidearm fastball. He's thrown a sidearm fastball, overhand fastball, sidearm curveball, overhand curveball, and change speeds on both of them. We're talking about eight pitches. And basically, when you get right down to it, if you were scouting it, it'd be fastball and curve, but you don't know from what angle or what speed. Rafael Santana trying to pick up Randolph. One nothing Boston, second inning. Ball one. Santana playing with the bone chips in the right elbow really hurts him when he throws the ball. Although Rafael says it's okay when he swings the bat, it doesn't bother him then. One and all the count. I don't know why to remind me. Remember putting head Jones? Mm -hmm. Always had the bad feet. Putting head said it only hurt when I touched the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Two said, balls, no strike. Only hurts when I hit the ball. Santana, the former Mets player at short. Mm -hmm. The other day when the Yankees were off, he spent some time at Shea Stadium visiting with his old buddies. And they were kidding him. They said, how about if we vote you a share? And he said, no, no, I'm a Yankee now. I guess he thought he was going to do it himself. The breaking ball, little pop fly. Back at first base, Todd Benzinger will put it away. So Randolph is left at second. It's one nothing Boston. We'll be back after these messages. The three small signs obviously directed to George Steinbrenner. Sell the team, George, but look where the signs are. They're hung from the facade of the third deck. George Steinbrenner's box is directly behind home plate, so he can't see them. Obviously, it's like the guy winking at the chorus girl from the balcony. They hang their little sign, but no one of importance is going to see it as far as making a deal for the club. Marty Barrett, Dwight Evans, and Mike Greenwell. All one. Barrett singled in the first inning. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. If the guy winked at the chorus girl, would that be a blot on his escutcheon? <laughs> one ball and no strike. Yeah, that once upon a time was the uh, definition of optimism. The guy what? sitting in the last row of the balcony <laughs> winking at a girl in the chorus line. And I just thought of it looking at those signs up there. <laughs> Nowhere. Ball two, two and one. Yeah, you can be a long way away here. Mm. Two balls and one strike to Marty Barrett. Center stage, Richard Dotson. Two and one to count. The thing about Dotson, we we're talking about how he seems so uninspired and not in command. It must be very difficult to play back of him. Henderson is tying his laces in left field. Mattingly was swinging his arms and trying to twist his upper torso. But Dotson takes so long and then throws a lot of balls. He's three and two and it's hard for the defense to support him a good deal. Well you start to take it for granted that he's going to miss the strike zone and you're not ready to make the play. Look at Mattingly now just coming up out of a crouch. They're doing anything at all to keep the blood going. That's a tough kind of a pitcher to have. Ground ball to Randolph. One away. 
Pitching and defense work hand in hand, and it's a rhythm that both the uh, defense and the pitcher get into. But if you're, if you're taking a lot of time, you're back on your heels. And what's happening a lot of times, he is shaking off slot by just staring him down. They're really not together yet as to uh, how they're going to work this game. Show you what kind of a pattern he has, too. In 45 pitches, just about half of them, 22 have been balls. So he's kind of an anesthetic pitcher. He'll put you to sleep if you're playing back on him, unless nope. you're careful. Right now, you're ready for a play. Breaking ball, strike to Evans. So important to get ahead of the hitters for a lot of reasons. One out, third inning, one nothing Boston. Oh, and one. One and one. You know we, we've talked about that Red Barrett game but that must have been an easy game to play behind where he just makes uh, 58 pitches. Well, I'll tell you kid if I if I were good enough to play behind him I'd love to play behind him because he works so quickly is Tom Browning of the Cincinnati Reds who pitched the perfect game the other night against the Dodgers. Bob Gibson, Gibson was, was a guy. That's a guy I was going to bring up Gibson he got that ball from the catcher and threw it of course if you had his stuff what's the sense of yeah. pulling around. But Dotson just seems to be hesitant. I'm sure he's not. It's just just what he seems to give off as you sit there and watch him. Two and one to count to Evan. He's a nibbler and he's behind most of the time. See, like right now, you're an infielder, you're back on your heels. Two balls, one strike. Fouled away. Remember the old Jackie Gleason Art Carney routines where Gleason would say to Carney you know uh, write this down and Carney would take his pen and pad and keep flourishing his hands and finally Gleason would say will you write it down. <laughs> well when you watch Dotson all of a sudden you feel like say will you throw them all and maybe that undermines a hitter occasionally. No. Two and two. Ground ball roll to third. Pagliarulo. Two down. There's an expression that scouts use when they scout pitchers about going deep. And that means two and two, three and two. Two and two is going deep. Mm -hmm. And that's the pitch that you really have to get the hitter to make a decision on. I mean, get your decision because you go three and two, the momentum swings to the hitter. Well, Dotson has gone deep in the count to nine of the first 12 batters. Wow. Oh. By the way, Oakland leading Milwaukee, one nothing in the fourth inning. Remember, Milwaukee is on the edge they'll be snuffed out with any combination of four as will Detroit. The Yankee number is five. One ball no strikes. Ball two two and oh. over in the National League West the number is reduced to two. The Dodgers play this afternoon at Candlestick and Cincinnati plays tonight in Atlanta. Two and oh. And how about Oral Hershiser is that remarkable. Unbelievable. And I mean that's a strong string he's on watching him you you see him obviously every pitch but watch 49 him. consecutive scoreless inning and strong hit down the line foul on the count two and two the record Don Drysdale 58 straight and suddenly Hershiser who figured to pitch Wednesday night at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego oral Wednesday night would go to tie. Then it's a question of would they work him maybe an inning or two before the playoffs begin and he would have a chance to actually break it. That's a strike and that's that for the inning. So Dotson taking his time retire the side in order and it's still one nothing Boston. Here's an easy way to determine the magic number. Subtract the Red Sox victories from 163. That would give you 76. Then subtract the losses, the teams chasing them from that 76. So you see Milwaukee is 72. That's four. Detroit four. The Yankees five. That's the magic number. Can I try geography? I never was good in arithmetic. How about that one? <laughs> Can you add that up? The Yankees were lucky in 78, but there's no bucky, meaning 10, of course, in 88. Do you think that's either a foreigner or a guy who had a very snooty education? Look at the way he made the seven. 
Tell you, that's a European salmon. Yeah, that's a courageous guy to do that in Yankee Stadium, too. Bottom of the third, one nothing Red Sox. Strike. That's what they talk about in Beverly Hills. It's so expensive and high class. The graffiti's in French. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one. Henderson, Washington, Mattingly. One ball, one strike. Boy, what a magnificent day in New York. It doesn't get much better than this as we turn into the fall. Beautiful blue sky. Temperature around 70 degrees or thereabouts. No humidity to speak of. Just a a zephyr for a breeze. That's great. One and one. In there. It's a nice high sky, though. Uh, nice for us that are watching it, but the ball players, they'd love to see a few clouds up there. Makes it tough to catch that real high fly ball or pop fly. One and two, the count to Ricky Henderson. Remember, he had that check swing single in the first inning, so he's hit in eight straight. Curveball hit to short. Jody Reed shoots him down. One away. With one away, Claudel Washington the batter, then Don Mattingly. Red Sox one run, one hit. Yankees no runs, one hit. Two balls, no strikes. Washington had a check swing. But got himself all tied up in the box doing it, and Reed, despite juggling the ground ball, was able to throw him out. On the outside corner, two and one. Big chopper to the right side. Marty Barrett is on it. That takes care of Washington. We talked a moment ago and showed you the standings. We also showed you the magic number of how to determine it. Here are the games remaining. The Yankees have with the Red Sox here, and then they'll finish up on the road, Baltimore, and then next weekend in Detroit. The Tigers will finish at home hosting the Yankees. The Red Sox will finish up in Cleveland. And Milwaukee still has a ways to go. Oakland, California, and Oakland again. There's a line drive off the glove of Benzinger. Base hit. You know, just a little thing there that you saw. You saw Mattingly stand right on the bag. That's a bit of the information he got from advanced scouting because Gedman was sneaking down the line. Now watch the ball go off the glove of Benzinger, and Benzinger is not near first base. A lot of times the fellow will take that big turn, and the catcher sneaks behind him. But Mattingly, with that information, you saw him just stop at the bag, and Gedman was, he was there all right. Benzinger, who is a converted outfielder, is 6-1. And he really went up the ladder to even get the leather on the ball. With a nice try. Single for Mattingly, and a slumping Dave Winfield, who walked in the first inning. It's still 1-0 Red Sox, two out in the third inning. And Mattingly bluffs. And there's a strike. Mattingly putting on a good show as if he was going to take off. Mattingly this year has just one stolen base. So he certainly doesn't figure to run. Don't want to take that bat out of this big guy's hands. And that's hammered to center. That'll be a base hit in front of Ellis Burke. So the Yankees have runners at first and second, and Winfield wouldn't be human if he didn't stand there and think, oh, if I had done that last night when he stranded seven batters. You know, in a spot like this, Vinny, even just watching the game, I, I like to play along with the batter. If I'm Jack Clark now, I got to look for that big, slow lollipop that he threw. Now, if it's anything besides that, I'm going to have to take it. Now, that would be my thinking. Of course, if he looks for fastball and gets it, he's going to hit out of the ballpark. But I would be waiting until I had two strikes to see if he'll throw me that big lollipop. Just to remind the viewers, after being set up with slow curveballs, a fastball caught him looking in the first inning. So two on, two out in the third. And he starts him with a slow breaking ball up. One ball and no strike. I'd still look for the curveball here. 
That has been Clark's problem. He has been looking. He hadn't swung the bat yet. One and oh. Another slow curve. Now it's a dilemma. You got the pitcher, two balls, no strikes. He's got base runners at first and second. He can't afford to walk you. Is he going to go with his fastball? Or are you going to look for it? I'm guessing. I'm looking curveball. And Boddicker is mad at himself. He was storming back of the mound. He wanted that one ball, no strike curve and missed way outside. So Clark really has the upper hand for the moment. In there, turn one. You know, his fastball is about medium. It, is, it certainly is not what you call a hummer by any means, yet Boddicker struck out 10 this year against Kansas City. Yeah, but if you're doing what Clark just did, look for the breaking ball, he'll get the fastball by you. And that's what he just did. Two and one. Off the rubber. Mattingly at second, Winfield at first, two out in the third. Red Sox with a first inning run, trying to make it stand up. So you can say any way you want. Some hitters say, well, I anticipate a pitch. I look for a pitch. It boils down to their guessing. Two and one. Breaking ball. Soft swing. The roller to third, and they get the force play. So Clark still hasn't had a good rip at all. They leave two. And now here's a look back at a very special Olympic moment. You know, pitching coaches sit on the bench, they do a lot of things. They watch the mechanics, of course, but a lot of them chart pitches. Just to give you an idea, we were charting pitches. Dotson has made in three innings 55 pitches. That projects to about 165. And of those 55 pitches, 29 strikes, 26 balls. That's not very good. And then you go down to the third inning, which he had a 1-2-3 inning. He had a 3-2 count on Barrett, 2-2 on Evans, 2-2 on Greenwell, which means he went deep with every hitter. A good barometer. Interestingly enough, however, despite laboring on the mound, Dodson has allowed only one hit and one run, which came on a ground ball by this hitter, Todd Benzinger. And it's popped in the air behind the plate. Don Slaught getting help from Pagliarulo, and let's see, Pagliarulo, and where was the pitcher? He was still on the mound, and the only thing Dotson has to do in this world at that moment is get over there and direct traffic. Bad play. He could have bought a ticket because he was a spectator. Slot would not have made that play. We talked about the high sky. It's a good thing Pags ran him off that play. And what the pitcher's got to do is get over there and start screaming. And if he sees there's going to be a collision, there's nothing wrong with grabbing the catcher. The one guy you don't want to have make the play is the catcher because he's got that big pillow, and it's easier for the infielder to do. But uh, Dotson was just watching the play. And I think Pagliarulo went by and took a little bite out of Dotson because Dotson will never leave the mound. Never. Now watch Slot. Slot thinks he's got it, but it's way behind him. He's lost it right there. He hasn't got it. And now he hears Pagliarulo. He would not have gotten that. Fouled away. And then Pagliarulo, in returning the ball to the mound, went by and raised his voice. So he was a little hot. A teammate of mine who was a low key guy that you knew, the late Howard Paulette, he mm -hmm. was very low key, right? On a play like that, he'd be screaming in your ear, you know, and then I hear you, you're turkey, and but he didn't want anything to happen. That's what the good pitcher does. There's a bunt up along first base, fielded by Dotson, who nipped him. So Ellis Burks thrown out on the bunt attempt, two down in the fourth inning. Dotson got off that mound in good shape, and Mattingly gave him a good target, and it was a good play. I wonder, too, psychologically, if Burks took all that in and said, here's a pitcher who stayed on the mound on that foul ball, whose third baseman might have chipped at him going by. Maybe he'll be deep in thought. It would be a good idea to drag one on him. I'm sure that might have, it could have been a factor, but uh, I tell you, he got over there in good shape, and Mattingly was right there, nice inside, and the infield side of the bag, gave him a good target, and Dotson, once he got the ball, didn't rush it. Here's the last man to get aboard against Dotson, and that's Jody Reed who walked in the second inning. He's retired eight in a row. I tell you, if he gets a one, two, three inning here, that's going to be the big pump of whatever that the Yankee bench needs. Hard breaking ball away, one and one. Jody Reed picked up his first major league hit a year ago, and as we told you, didn't really play much for the Sox until after. June 30th 
and now he's a solid fixture. Ground ball to Santana, and he can't get much on the throw with the bad elbow, but he just does nip him anyway. Nine in a row retired by Dotson. It's still 1-0 Boston. A moment frozen in the memory bank. Fifth game, 1975 World Series, Reds and Red Sox. Joe Morgan, a drive to right, and a big catch by Dwight Evans in right field. Dewey, who makes so many big plays. Had that big home run last weekend up at Fenway Park. Had a monstrous home run last night. Boy, everybody remembers the catch, but you saw what he did right away. Got it back in the infield. Ended up a double play. He wasn't satisfied with just making the catch. Mike Pagliarulo, a shot foul outside of first on one. Pagliarulo, Randolph, and Slot. We're in the fourth inning. The Red Sox leading one to nothing. Pagliarulo struck out in the second inning on one of those big slow curveballs. It's a kind of a curve that looks like it's a ball by the time the catcher catches it. You look back at the catcher's mitt and it's almost on the ground. But it's a question of where that pitch is coming into the strike zone. To call that the American Legion Roundhouse. One and one. Roller up along first base, fielded there by Benzinger. And that takes care of Pagliarulo, one away. Then you think time doesn't fly. The young bat boy for the Yankees picking up the bats. You play. I played against his grandfather. You broadcast his grandfather's pitching. That's Clyde, Clyde King's grandson Jay. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. There he is. Clyde, the pitching coach. Norma, his wife, is here. Must be a big thrill. Here's Willie Randolph hit by a pitch in the second inning. Ball one. Well, you talk about a surveyor. That's what Bodiger did to Darrell Cousins. He made his pitch and just stared. He couldn't believe that fastball didn't catch a corner. Umpires love that too. Mm, I bet. They always say, tell him to just get the ball and throw. In direct contrast to last night's 10 9 game, it's 1 0 today in the fourth. Big slow curveball. Last night, a total of 25 hits. Today, thus far, a total of only four hits, and the losing team has three of them. One and one to Willie Randolph. Ball two, two and one. Mike Boddicker trying to win his 13th. Big chopper to shortstop. Jody Reed got a nice hop to handle. Two down. The American League East has been the only division of the four where you had a change of leader since the last week in May. In other words, by the last week in May, the American League West, the National League East, and the National League West, all those leaders moved in to stay. But in the American League East, you remember the Red Sox didn't really take over first place till Labor Day. They tied Detroit on Labor Day then broke the tie on Labor Day Milwaukee and the Yankees were tied for third four games back. Two balls and no strikes to count a Don Slaught fouled out in the second 0 for 1 hitting 272. Boddicker is having to work for his win today. That's in there. When he was with Baltimore, he had an average of three runs from the offense. With the Red Sox, he's getting five. Boy, that's a whale of a difference. Fastball, line to right. Evans was thinking about throwing to first. But Benzinger was way off the bag. We're talking about that before the game. I started to say that uh, Joe Morgan was talking about it because uh, he says on artificial surface, although we're playing on grass here, he said that play can be made a lot. He just happened to say to me, he said, did you ever see that play? I said, yeah, I saw no hit in Brooklyn. You, you probably broadcast that game. Mel Queen, mm -hmm. Frillo got him Frillo. at first base. Right. And uh, that play can happen on the artificial surface. And even here, Evans was not satisfied. It just 
plate on one hop and lob it in. He took a look, and if Benzing was there, I wouldn't have been surprised to see a throw. It was a perfect combination, a hard line drive with two out and the catcher hitting. Don't look. Here's Rafael Santana. That's discriminatory. <laughs> Really is, man. Well, I mean, it was the perfect setup, though. No, it wasn't. No. What if you got a slow running infielder? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Santana popped up in the second inning, 0 for 1. Slow curveball hit down the left field line. Base hit. The ball is still in play. And we'll have runners at second and third. He hit that about as hard as it was thrown. He just kind of served it. That's one of those you would see at Forest Hills during the open. He did not really drill that ball, just put that bat on it. You can see his weight shift already, and the bat just, he served it out there just perfectly. So the Yankees, with two out after Fagliarulo and Randolph made out, get a single from Slaud and a double for Santana. The Yankees have been very wasteful. They've left five men in three innings, and now they have runners at second and third with two out on the fourth. They're in danger of making it seven left on unless Henderson can do something. So Boddicker has been victimized on two of his pitches. He tried to come a little sidearm with a fastball to slot, and he singled a right. And then he came over him with that big slow curveball, and Santana doubled. So now let's see what Henderson gets. Henderson has done everything but call time. He's just wandering around there, uh, waiting for Bodiger to get ready. When Bodiger was ready, he backed out. A little game going on here. Interestingly, Henderson led off the game with an infield single one of the five Yankee hits the other four have all come with two out slow breaking ball up ball one Does that tell you anything about a hitter and about a pitcher especially who allows hits with two outs well only that he may be letting up I mean you'd, you'd talk to him about it and you'd ask him about it one and oh Slow breaking ball for a strike, one and one. It's a pretty good pattern in four innings. You've it's allowed four hits with two out. It's worth asking about yeah. saying, hey, you know, when you get two outs, I don't think you're bearing down. I mean, that's all you have to say. And with some pitchers, they'll agree, others will argue. One, one. And he missed ball two. On deck. Claudel Washington and Marty Barrett's going to go to the mound. He called Gedman out. And uh, he's got something on his mind very definite whenever you see an infielder call a catcher out. And that could be anything from, hey, signals I'm not getting them. He may be getting them over there, or, or you're calling too many curveballs or whatever. Well, Marty Barrett is acting like Joe Morgan for the moment. Marty calling the meeting, and he's doing a little bit of lecturing. And with that hand over his mouth, that's no accident either. No. He's making sure that Gene Michael, the third base coach, could not read his lip. He switched signs is what he did, because uh -huh. he just went over and told Reed that uh, they've switched signs. Now, whether Santana's flashing them, he must be giving a pretty good indication. And it's not telling him the pitch. He's really more the location. And it's an easy thing to give the location. You could do it any win of a, a thousand ways. Let's watch Santana uh, get a lead and I'll make something up for you. Two balls, one strike. It's one nothing Red Sox, bottom of the fourth, two out, and a fake by Mike Bodiger. Now, for example, you saw him look back to second base. That could be the ball is going to be inside. If I don't look back to second base, it'll be outside. I mean, that kind of thing. It's an easy thing to just give the sign, I mean, from second base. No big deal. Two and one. Breaking ball over, two and two. I love the idea that Marty Barrett was so concerned about what he was saying that he would take his right index finger, press it to his upper lip, so there's no way anybody could read what he was saying. That was that was really a thoughtful defensive gesture against Gene Michael, the third base coach. You don't trust anybody. I mean, you huh. got to take a page right out of a James Bond movie, thinking that everybody's stealing everything and you're wired. Two and two. Sidearm roundhouse, and he missed with it. 
a lot of hitters you give them the location and they really don't care about the pitch and there are other guys you give them the pitch and they become 500 hitters well what do you do three and two you have first base open another big slow curve I wouldn't give in to him whatever he thinks is his best pitch fastball fouled away so after all the, the curve balls both overhand and sidearm he came back three two at the knees Henderson might have been a little late on the fastball and fouled it off you know it's an easy thing to say best pitch but you don't really know unless you're behind that plate because it's the best pitch at that particular time that obviously for Bodica was the best pitch because the way he'd set him up with the curveball three and two remember he gave up a base hit on the fastball and the double on the curve fastball fouled away again he had a little better swing at that one than he did the first one now I wonder after exactly. coming in with two fastballs you see he's got a better swing now do I come back off speed yeah but you see that may be what Henderson's thinking about I just started to say that because he fouled the pitch off that he wanted to hit and now he's got to be thinking well I got to get a piece of it but now bodiker has got a bit of an edge because he can go to that curveball he's got you thinking it so if you're thinking it then you know that Henderson is three and two slot at third Santana at second one to nothing Red Sox bottom of the fourth inning shook him off so Bodiker is very definite as to what he wants to do and that's all you can do is suggest it's up to the pitcher boy letting him hang three and two slow curveball fouled away into the crowd behind the dugout so this is some three and two battle. We've had two fastballs and now he went back to the slow breaking ball. And the big thing about it, he's been able to throw all the pitches for strikes with three and two. Mike Smithson will get up the big right hander and begin to loosen up back of Bonnaker. There's Mike. For Bonnaker, his ratio of strikeouts to walks is two to one. Uh, it's not overpowering. Three and two to Ricky Henderson. Boddicker has walked a batter, hit a batter, and he has struck out two. And a breaking ball hit the center, and Ellis Burks is there. And that's it. So Boddicker wins the battle. No runs, two hits, seven men left on. We'll be back. We're going to the fifth inning at Yankee Stadium with the Red Sox leading the Yankees one to nothing, and it's certainly a case of waste not, want not. The Yankees have wasted in their four innings. They have left seven, and they are yet to score. The Sox got a run in the first inning, and Boddicker and company have made it stand up. However, Richard Dotson appears to have squared himself away after a very slow, raggedy start, and Dotson has retired the last nine in a row. Interestingly, it took him 55 pitches to do the job in the first three innings. He got the side out on seven pitches in the fourth. Rich Gedman, first ball swinging, popped up to Pagliarulo. One away. That's 10 in a row for Dotson. Ed Romero grounded to short in the second inning. He's 0 for 1. He's cut down on his pitches, Vin. Dramatically. In fourth inning, he only made seven pitches. One ball and no strikes. There's a shot by Pandurulo and down the line. Romero around the bag on his way for two and Henderson gets it back in. So a double by Romero and Wade Boggs will be asked to pick him up. Romero drilling it by the diving Pagliarulo. He gave it a good effort. I thought he was going to come up with it. He slapped at the ground. I think he thought he might have come up with it sometime. Henderson has some trouble. See, that's not an easy thing because it, that padding is about, oh, maybe six, eight inches under there. That ball gets under there, you got some problems. 
wouldn't be a bad idea, you would think, to fill that in. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Boggs walked and grounded out. 0 for 1. One away. Romero at second in the fifth inning. Red Sox leading one to nothing. The remarkable accomplishment. The first player in this century. How about that Conseco 40 40 40 40. Mm. Of course I really like many others don't think that much of it. By that I mean. I really feel I have been several other players who could have done it. But not. Under the same circumstances in other words Willie Mays could have been a 40 40 man but he didn't run that much. Mantle could have done it. Mantle could have done it. Aaron might very well have done it. But you know what? If I'm Conseco, I'm saying, yeah, they could have. How but come I they did it? You got it. And I don't blame him. That's a tremendous, tremendous thing. 40 40. They used to think the guy had 40 home runs and he was just a big clod. But he's some athlete. Two balls, no strikes. The Wade Boggs with the count his way. Boggs has already walked 118 times and then added one in the first inning. So one more bad pitch he'll have 120 walks this year. Three and oh to Wade. On deck Marty Barrett. And there it is 120 walks for Wade Bonds. Remember when you were a kid and they'd all holler hey a walks as good as a hit. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but there are runners at first and second with one out, and Marty Barrett coming up, Clyde King on the phone to the bullpen. And Marty in the series last week in Fenway Park, and even here, has been pulling the ball, although his base hit was a center field, he went to the second baseman, he hit a hard foul down that left field line. You just can't give him that, that he usually does from center field to the right field line. I, tell you, this, I think he's a tough hitter. He sure is. There's Steve Shields loosening up in the Yankee bullpen. Barrett with a career high 62 RBIs. So two on, one out, one nothing Red Sox, top of the fifth inning. Fastball hit the shortstop. They're going to get one there and two there. No run. One hit, a man left. And at the end of four and a half, one nothing Red Sox. Claudel Washington, Don Mattingly, and Dave Winfield. One nothing Boston, fifth inning. The Yankees have not been retired in order, and they've left seven men in four innings. That's right. Washington, a couple of ground balls to short and second. Oh and one. No balls and two strikes. Perhaps it doesn't mean very much anywhere else in the United States, but here in New York, the folks are taking notice of an anniversary, certainly a painful anniversary for many. A little pop fly, and Boddicker will take care of it. That was painful for Claudel Washington. Uh, that's one of those that you, you don't want to tape and show to kids. The anniversary. In 1957, on this date, the last game ever played at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. It was a night game. The Dodger left-hander Danny McDevitt pitched a shutout and beat Pittsburgh three to nothing. Twenty, thirty, thirty-one years ago exactly today. Here's Don Mattingly grounded out and singled off the glove of Benzinger. Mattingly one for two. Mattingly with all of his other attributes does not strike out very much about every 19 at bats although he is not the toughest one and one. The toughest in the major leagues would be Cincinnati shortstop Barry Larkin. He strikes out about every 23 at bats. Scott Bradley of Seattle strikes out every 21 at bats and then you have Mattingly about every 19. 
a roller to first nice hop for Benzinger two down then of course there are the fellows who seem to strike out when they're leaving the dugout Pete in Cavillia Andres Galarraga and Juan Samuel uh, Dave Winfield the batter Winfield walk and single he's one for one Winfield walked with a runner at second in the third inning and then singled with a runner aboard in the third after a famine like night last evening where he stranded seven big slow curveball strike one there are always stories around the Yankees you just wonder if Winfield's contract is up George has to sit down with him and there's talk about Mattingly being traded we think and how about Dallas Green how about oh, that story yep. I mean here's a club in a pennant race with a week to go and they contend with a big rumor that Dallas Green is going to replace Lou Pinella who by the way you know Pinella was given a three year contract it doesn't start until 1989 however as I understand it it is not a legal baseball contract because it hasn't been filed yet with the league office so to say that the Yankee situation is up in the air is the understatement of the year one and two. What else are they saying that this will be the last year for Dave Rigetti certainly in relief he has had program. a terrible time going to go back to starting big shake up big trades I don't know one and two to Winfield breaking ball missed the day of decision for Winfield is October the 15th whether they will renew his contract which calls for if I understand it correctly two million a year so that's a four million dollar decision or a buyout of two million. Jack Clark's another name they're talking about trading. Off speed, rolled up the middle. Reed trying to come back and get it, but he can't. Winfield making a turn and holding on. And he's two for two. But it's a two out single. I tell you, if Burks doesn't charge that ball, Winfield's got himself a two base hit because he made a big turn and that ball was hit nice and soft. Looked like a snake going through that grass. Isn't it something? No, here we go again with Boddicker. Yep. Five hits. All five hits coming with two out. That one, though, was a pretty good pitch. He hit it off the end of the bat. Romero was playing deep at third, and uh, Reed was protecting the hole between Short and the third baseman. And so there was a lot of room up the middle, and Winfield hit it right off the end of the bat. It just snuck its way through there. Well, here's Jack Clark. Fool set up on curveballs and was caught looking at a fastball. Did not have a very good swing when he hit into a force play in the third inning. So he hasn't had a good hack yet against Mike Boddicker. Winfield bluffs and the pitch a strike. Winfield has stolen eight out of 12. If nothing else trying to distract Boddicker. Boy I'm surprised Clark took that pitch you can see the indecision because uh, after the last two times at bat you think the first fastball he's going to fly open. And he looks at a fastball and he's in a hole yeah. now. Oh and two. That's just he, he's guessing and he's guessing wrong. He's the first one to admit that he is confused over the way the American League pitchers have been pitching him in his first year in the league. He's just going to widen that zone a little bit now. Bodiker is. Oh and two. In fact that was kind of a half a pitch out. It, it was. wasn't a, it wasn't a good pitch out. But at least he got it high. Joe Morgan, as he is wont to do, sitting quietly. He's seen it all. I tell you, he's amazing. His, his, his pregame press conferences are very polite. One and two. And there goes Winfield. Fastball away, and the throw is behind him into center. Winfield is up and at him to third. You can see what happened to Gedman. He kind of got caught there because he really doesn't take a step and throw that ball. He threw that ball flat footed and there was no way he was going to throw it straight. Now watch when he throws. You watch Winfield. He gets off and running right now straight steel. Watch Gedman now. 
I mean, he just threw a sailor. He kind of stepped to the side a little bit, but it was not where you step right into it and go into that throw. So Gedman, only his fourth error of the year as he tried to throw sidearm and threw it behind Barrett. And the Yankees again have the time run 90 feet away. Breaking ball is fouled away. Just got a piece of it. The Yankees left Henderson at third in the first inning. They left Slaught at third in the fourth. And now they have Winfield at third in the fifth. Certainly can't practice catching foul tips. No way you can do that. What you want to do is keep that glove pliable. And you saw Gedman work on it, hoping that the next foul tip will hit that webbing and stay. Two and two. And another curveball foul back. You know, I'm wondering. With all of the modern devices we have, you just said something. You certainly can't practice foul tips. I wonder. I wonder if somebody isn't going to combine the automatic pitching machine with some kind of an automatic hitting machine that can be adjusted so that the arm could actually foul balls back. Somebody probably come up with it yet. And there's going to be a chopper to second. Tough play for Barrett. Got him. Fastball to hit him right on the hands. No runs a hit. The Yankees have left eight in five innings. Then you take that last inning. Washington, a curveball off the hands that Bodiger made the catch. Mattingly grounds out to the first baseman, hit fairly hard. Winfield sneaks that ball through. Clark, a little half swing almost. I mean, and you're talking about your. Second, third, fourth, and fifth place hitters. And I mean, it was like hitting it with a wet sporting news. They are killing the Yankee chances here because they have left eight men on in five innings. So Boddicker thoroughly frustrating the Yankee hitters. Now it'll be Evans, Greenwell, and Benzinger against Richard Dodson, who had retired 10 in a row, gave up a double and a walk, but got Marit to hit into a double play in the fifth inning. Ball one. Evans hit back to the box, grounded to third. Foul back. One ball, one strike. Big chopper to shortstop. Nice hop for Santana. He kind of shot puts it over to first. One away. Mike Greenwell having a remarkable year. Hits a hopper backhanded by Mattingly who gets him with a dive. A tremendous play by Mattingly because Greenwell not only hit that ball hard he got out of the box in great shape. And Mattingly knew he had to make that play. Watch this. It's going to be close, and here he goes into it. And he gets there. Good hustling play by Mattingly. It's a dangerous play, too, because the first baseman going head first to the bag, and Greenwell running for a base hit, liable to step on his head. Or his hands. Mm. Greenwell's a 195 pounder. So two down thanks to that brilliant play by Mattingly and here is Benzinger. Tell you one thing it would be extremely doubtful that Mattingly could have or would have made that play in the first two innings. Remember when Dotson was behind everybody and the infielders were squatting and the outfielders were shaking themselves. But Dotson has allowed just one hit since the first inning. He had that string of 10 in a row, and now his ball club is in the game. One ball, one strike to Todd Benzinger, who grounded out and fouled out. Little roller up along first, foul ball. And yet you wonder, why would they have Shields warming up so soon in that other inning? I mean, because he's only given up, as you said, that one hit, two hits the entire game. Dodson this year, 27 starts and four complete games. But it gives you an idea in this game Pinella still trying and he can't afford to wait more than a questionable situation time running out on him. Dotson 55 pitches in the first three innings last three innings only 22 pitches. That tells you quite a story. One and two. 
So it figures if he's going to get a good defensive play back on him, it would be in the last couple of innings. Deuce is wild on Bensinger. It's one nothing Red Sox in the sixth. Fastball rolled by Bumbrey. One run, two hits, one error for Boston. On deck, Ellisburg. No run, six hits. No errors for the Yankees, who have left eight. That tells you everything but the frustration. The eight left on. Sinker fouled away. Still two and two. Tomorrow, the final game of the series, Rick Roden and Roger Clemens. Got him. So Benzinger strikes out. Third strikeout for Dotson. It's still 1-0 Boston. Lou Pinella sitting behind Rafael Santana and alongside Chris Shambliss has really had some dilemmas as to what to do with a weak starting pitching staff and a bullpen that has really led him to grief. The Yankee bullpen is above 500. But Rigetti alone has blown 10 saves. And of course last night they really hit bottom when they couldn't hold a 9 5 lead late in the game and yet. He had Steve Shields up early today. He had him up today. You know, Joe Morgan talks about that, and he says, hey, you change pitchers the same way, whatever the league is. But then again, if you don't have anybody that you can go to and depend on, it makes a difference, obviously. That's all the way to the screen and rolling into the dugout, and the count one ball and one strike. Pagliarulo has struck out and grounded out. Rigetti has 23 saves. That would be high, and Lee Smith has 28. Fly ball to center, and Ellis Burks is there. In this day and age especially, it's virtually impossible to go anywhere without a bullpen that is doing well. In other words, Oakland's there, Dennis Eckersley with 40-some-odd saves. The Mets have a tremendous bullpen when they hit you with Roger McDowell and Randy Meyer. Lee Smith for the Red Sox. But the Yankees pitching has apparently been their demise. Strike to Randolph. Remember Whitey Herzog saying that a good bullpen will make you a great manager. Because that'll really erase the mistakes. No balls, one strike. Slow curveball in there for a strike. In the count, 0 and 2. Then a point in case is the Dodger bullpen. I mean that that to me is one of the big reasons if not the biggest why they are where they are. Yeah you're absolutely right. Sidearm fouled away. The Dodgers now with the luxury of two right handers either one could close with Pena and Howell. Howell basically the closer. And then they even made a deal to get an extra left hander Ricky Horton so that they could alternate with Orozco. The bullpen is is so important. Tell you how much this game of ours has changed. I was looking it up the other night. You know, the 1971 Chicago Cubs had 75 complete games. <laughs> Ferguson Jenkins that year, as you see, strike three. Ferguson Jenkins alone had 28 complete games in 1971. And here, 17 years later, Nobody completes a game, or if you do, it's it's a big deal. Well, managers tell you, go into the sixth inning, and I'll see that you won't be uh, charged with the loss because they go right to that bullpen. The complete game is going the way of dirt. It's and obsolete. Buffaloes. And Buffaloes. Here's Don Slaught, fouled out and single. He had a fastball into right field for a base hit, but he gets a breaking ball for a strike. On one. Romero really guards the line against Don Slaught. Thinking he's going to pull that ball, yet his base hit went to the opposite field. We see if he gets any more fastballs. Yep, there's one, but way outside. One ball, one strike. Slot the other night in a 12-inning game hit a home run to beat Baltimore. 
Off speed, half swing, no swing, says Rocky Rowe, and the count two and one. That 12 inning game with Baltimore, that was the game where Tommy John at 45 went 10 innings. Two and one. Now let's see if Bodega could get by an inning without a two out base hit. Ball three. He's had four innings in a row where he's been able to get the first two hitters Henderson and Washington in the third Pagliarulo and Randolph in the fourth Washington and Mattingly in the fifth Pagliarulo and Randolph in the sixth and yet five of the six hits he has allowed have come with the two out fastball hit would you believe that <laughs> is that that's maddening I mean if you're Bill Fisher you got to have a heart to heart talk with him. Well, you keep reminding them, and I, I would think that particular where that pitch was was a, really a case of a, a good pitch being hit, and you can see Boddicker himself slammed the ball in his glove as if to say, "I don't know what's going on either." Raviel Santana popped up, but remember he got a big slow curveball and doubled inside third down the line. That was back in the fourth inning, but the Yankees still came up empty. It's one to nothing, Boston. Bottom of the sixth, the Yankees. Have left eight men on. They have not been retired in order today. Fastball for a strike. And Ben, I'm convinced that Bodiger knows about the two out base hit because you could just see him as he got set to make that pitch. His, his shoulders, he took a big deep breath and kind of slumped over as if to say, What is going on? Yeah, he's got to be saying, I want to make one inning where I don't have to pitch out of a stretch. Whoa, good save. That fastball was heading for the backstop. One and one. A good time to decoy and start running back to the screen. <laughs> of course, with slot on a catcher, I know what you're thinking. I uh, know. Yes, you are. <laughs> one and one, the count to Rafael Santana. One nothing, Red Sox, bottom of the sixth inning. Breaking ball, and it seemed to skid over the plate. One and two. He throws that pitch, and it looks like it gets right in front of the plate, stops, and then a big breaking curveball. And it hasn't gotten them a thing. Just missed. What a great pitch. That pitch works for you. That sets up this one right here. Coming right on the heels of that little sidearm curveball. And he tried to drill the outside corner. Two balls, two strikes. Santana hitting 239. Sidearm curveball got him swinging. Four strikeouts, eight men, now nine left on by the Yankees. We'll be right back. It is one to nothing in favor of the Red Sox as the Yankees continue to spend their money. Sitting quietly, resting today, far from the spotlight, 18 game winner Bruce Hurst, who is 13 and 1 at Fenway Park this year. If you're Joe Morgan, what do you do if you get into the playoffs against Oakland and it opens up remember in Fenway do you start Bruce Hurst or do you start Roger Clemens. Who do you start. I think I'd start Hurst. I would too. Yep. Here's Ellis Burks. Burks has struck out. Tapped a bunt back in the fourth inning. Ball one. One run two hits for the Red Sox. No run, seven hits for the Yankees. They've left nine men in six innings. So Dotson has pitched extremely well after that wobbly beginning. Two tell balls. You, tell you how well the last uh, three innings he needed seven, eight, and eleven pitches. It's pretty good. After the first two innings, where he was behind on almost every hitter. And he's behind now 3 and 0 to Ellis Burks. Remember we talked about Dotson. You're talking about a fellow in 1983 was a 22 game winner. He was brilliant. And he walked him. A dangerous way to start. It's only the third time in seven innings that the Red Sox have managed to get the leadoff man on each time by a walk and the first leadoff man to walk. Scored in the first inning. Wade Boggs. 
And they're setting up a defense, and the bullpen's going to get ready because Burks has stolen 25 bases. He was the guy that was on first last night when Pinella made the switch to bring in Skinner to replace Slot. Now they're going to be looking bunt, but uh, they could do a lot of things with Reed in that batter's box. And you saw Steve Shields, the right hander, and Hippolito Pena, the left hander, loosening up. Reed has walked and grounded out. Jody Opal one. High fly ball. Pagliarulo has no idea where it is, and it's way down the line. That was something. Pagliarulo was dancing underneath the ball that wasn't there. He had been in on the grass <laughs> looking a for a punt. Look. Yeah. <laughs> Because he never did see it. That was something. Look at he's flicking with the glass. I got it. I got it. Got what? It was way down the line. <laughs> Owen won the count. I'll tell you that high sky is not helping anybody on those pop flies, and he just lost it completely. On one to Jody Reed. Ellis Burks, the runner at first, has stolen 25 bases. So they have to keep an eye on 25 out of 34. 0 and 1 to count. Jody Reed. One ball, one strike. Now look out. Reed checking. Rack slider at third, looking into Joe Morgan. And Ellis Burks at the ready at first. Boy, that expression told you nothing. No. One nothing Red Sox, seventh inning. Balls and one strike. Manager's delight. There are managers now, like football coaches, who are keeping computerized records of their own decisions to make sure they don't have too much of a strong tendency to, for instance, always play hit and run two and one or always squeeze two and one. So they're taking a page out of football now, trying to make sure what they do is not habit forming. And they play bunt. So Reed pushes him up a notch. Burks to second base. Two balls, one strike. That is an extremely cautious play, isn't it? Well, uh, it's a tribute to what Boddicker has been doing, and he wants to be sure he picks up another run. Uh, Morgan does. Stay away from that uh, double play. I'll tell you, that was a good bunt, too. Reed is a good bunter. He sacrificed 11 times. The reason that you say, boy, that's conservative, is Reed doesn't strike out. I mean, he's had 350, 360 at bats, and he struck out only 20 times, and they're leading. And with the count his way, they still had him bunt. So that, that was something. But the inning record is the double play. That's what he's staying away from. And here is Gedman now, grounded out and popped up 0 for 2. Of course, that's another thought. Let me ask you about it. As far as setting up your inning, here's the point. You're going to set up the inning to stay out of the double play, and you sacrifice a guy hitting 311 for a fellow who's hitting 220. Isn't that kind of strange thinking? No, no. I, I go along with that pun all the way because we're, we're here now in the seventh inning. And there's going to be the base hit from the 220 hitter. And here comes the run scored as Winfield falls down. He may be hurt. He might be. Winfield rolling over. He looked and like his, he's not up. It looked like his spikes got caught. You know what? It came to me like that. Mickey Mantle. Mantle the drain. Yep. I'll tell you. Let's watch it. There, oh, oh right wow. there. That yeah, really hyper extended that left knee. That, that that ankle just turned too. See that? Yeah. Watch that left knee will extend the other way. Come right there. See it? That's that hyper extension. Yeah. He's in trouble with that. Mm. 
So Gedman a base hit. Burke scores. The Red Sox now have that bigger run to take a bunt away from the Yankees and lead 2 nothing. And more importantly now Winfield down. It certainly appeared to be a hyperextension of the left knee. And and that the, the knee and the ankle. I'll tell you. Boy. He's lucky if he can get up and walk away from that. Mm. Watch that left knee and the right there. Look at the ankle and knee. Watch it. Coming up. Right now. The heel, the heel kind of gave on him. It was worse than trying to touch your toes without bending your leg because that left leg actually extended the other way. There. Mm. He's, he's up. Look at that thing. Boy, you talk about stretching it. He's got to be in remarkable shape to survive that. The Winfield. Got away cheaply on that play, believe me. It is two to nothing in favor of Boston here in the seventh inning. And Lou Pinella is out to the mound, and let's see if he's brought a hook. You had Steve Shields, Hippolito Pena, and you have Ed Romero followed by Wade Boggs. It's all started with a base on balls to Burks and the sacrifice, so it was just text textbook. And Gedman didn't hit the ball that hard. It wasn't as if he was really ripped. So the walk, sacrifice, and a looping single to right. And now Romero will be the batter. Two to nothing, Boston in the seventh. Romero grounded to short and double to left in the fifth inning. He's playing third today because Wade Boggs fouled a ball. Onto his instep of his right foot. Boggs is able to hit, so he's a designated hitter, and Romero plays defensively. Well, it's pretty obvious Joe Morgan, he doesn't pay that much attention to statistics. Seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, he stays right with the basics. Breaking ball, ball one. Interesting, as we mentioned, three leadoff men in seventh inning, all three reaching on walks, and two of the three scoring. While the Yankees have been squandering opportunities and have left nine. There goes Gedman, a hit and run ball to Dotson, who throws late to second in time at first. So it's 1 4 3 if you're scoring, and safely aboard at second is Gedman. Dotson was just sure that he was going to get that double play with that ball hit back to him and Gedman running on the play he stays away from it and where was Romero. Oh <laughs> that's why. <laughs> now he wasn't even close at first base. No. So two down. Gedman at second base and here is Boggs trying to pick him up. It is two to nothing Red Sox in the seventh. Will he swing at the first pitch this time? Only if he really loves it. Ball one. I'm sure he's up there saying, I'm only going to look at something in the sweet spot, something I can drive with two out and a chance to pick up an RBI. One and oh. Two and oh. Somebody described Wade Boggs as hitting like the balls on a tee. He can do exactly what he wants to do. He's had three swings out of 15 pitches today. 2 and 0. Oh. 3 and 0. Oh. Wouldn't you hate to be behind him in a supermarket the way he shops for pitches? <laughs> yeah, you talk about being selective. Oh. He'd be squeezing the tomatoes, the apples, everything. He is really selective. Selected company, too. Put him on. Yeah, no sense monkey and now three and oh. So Boggs walks for the third time. 121 walks he's received. In looking at Wade Boggs, it brings to mind those fellows who have won the batting championship in the Merrill League, and those fellows turn out to be Boggs and a brief respite with Mattingly. So the American League is bogged down. Look at the numbers, too. I mean, they are way up there. You talk about a high rent district, 363. 
The last we saw, Tony Gwynn was leading the National League, hitting 315. And today he was hitting 313. Ball one. But you also notice that the leaders were Boggs, a left hand hitter, and Mattingly. We go back to that note about Kirby Puckett. He could wind up with the highest batting average by a right hand batter in the American League since Joe DiMaggio back in like 1939. That's what kind of a year Puckett is having, and he's not getting a call. Ball two. Puckett will be put in the category with Whistler's father. Mm. <laughs> How many hits? A lot of hits. He oh, he know. had the other day he had 216, and that's a well-kept secret. Yep. In fact, he now has 221. Kirby Puckett. 221 hits. Oh. Meanwhile, Richard Dotson is back to the way he was in the first inning. He has walked two, given up a base hit, and he's behind three and zero to Barrett, and on deck. Dwight Evans. He loses him. I think he's gone. Yeah, Shields getting ready in the pen as Dewey loosens up on deck. And he lost him. The bases are loaded. And here comes Pinella. And there goes Richard Dotson. Seven walks allowed by Richard Dotson today. Seven. So Pinella will go to the bullpen and that has become a lot like the toad ride. It has become very interesting. Steve Shields will pick up with the bases loaded. Richard Dotson was a masterful pitcher for four innings today. Unfortunately he got into the seventh inning. Boy in the third fourth fifth and sixth. Dotson was as good as you can get but he had troubles in the first two innings and finally wobbly and had to come out in the seventh. Steve Shields without a save and an earned run average of more than four and a half. Play a game Vin. he's got to get ahead when he go fastball or curveball what'd you guess. I got to guess fastball. Yes sir. And he started with. I'm not sure that might have been a breaking yeah, ball with too much of a spin on it one ball and no strike. High curveball. Shields two to one as far as strikeouts to walks. Dwight Evans extremely tough hitter anyway. You know he's hitting 545 with the bases loaded and 15 RBIs. Ball two. Hey, we talked about it last week. There's nobody has a better work ethic than this fellow. I think if, if I were a manager I'd say hey watch Evans during infield practice and watch him during batting practice. No nonsense. One reason why he's still playing every day and he's coming up 37 years old. Jam foul back slot coming back. Can't get there. Gave it his best shot. Two and one. Evans who was jammed cracked his bat and he'll have to go back to the wood pile. So Shields made a pretty good pitch on him and Evans is fortunate that he's still up and while he's getting the bat you talk about the changes in baseball there's a change that crack bat they used to just throw it away give it to a kid now they wrap it in cellophane and say Daryl Evans cracked this bat in the seventh inning of a game against the Yankees and they sell it for about 20 bucks I'm sure for a good cause for charity for no uh, no it goes right into what they call the store now. They have these stores, the baseball teams that sell this thing. Well, I swear, Joe. I'm telling you the truth, <laughs> partner. That's what they do. Two and one, the count to Dwight Evans. Bases loaded in the seventh inning. Two to nothing, Red Sox. Two out. If they want to do it for charity, I got one for them. It's very simple. They break a bat, give it the bat. Shields really in trouble. Three and one. Gedman at third, Boggs at second, Barrett at first. Two out. A three ball, one strike count on Evans and the Red Sox trying to break the game open. Yeah. 
walked him, and it is three to nothing, Boston. Eight base on balls the Red Sox have been given. Hmm. And Pinella is about to make maybe make a move just that fast. Mike Greenwell coming up. He has Hippolito Pena, the left-hander in the bullpen. So I assume that Pena was throwing to get ready for just this moment. And Pena, as he throws, Lou Pinella throwing some verbal darts at played him by Darrell Cousins. He thought that 3-1 pitch was a strike. So in the inning, Burks walked. And with one out, Gedman singled him in with two out, Boggs walked, Barrett walked. That was all for Dotson. And now Evans walks. The run is charged to Dotson. <laughs> You're right. One of the brightest young stars in baseball today, outfielder Mike Greenwell of the Boston Red Sox. He'll be coming up with the bases loaded in the seventh and two out, and the Sox leading 3-0. Greenwell has a remarkable set of numbers. In fact, only two players in the last 33 years would come close to the numbers that Greenwell has. Since Musial in 1955, the only two other players would be George Brett, and in 1976, Joe Morgan had the kind of a year that he has. We'll try and explain that in a minute. First ball swinging and he hits a fly ball to center to Claudel. So we'll have to get back to that later. One pitch the final out. The Sox get two and leave three. It's three nothing Boston. Three nothing Red Sox bottom of the seventh inning. And Ricky Henderson Claudel Washington and Don Mattingly against Mike Boddicker. Henderson led off the game with an infield single and died at third and the Yankees have stranded nine men in six innings and have failed to score. Henderson an infield single grounded a short fly to center he wants Darrell Cousins to look at the ball. Looking at a area obviously scuffed. And now he said, wait a minute, I don't like the way this ball looks. He's going to go out and talk to Boddicker. And Ed Gedman's arguing with him. He doesn't like the way that ball looks. Hey, he's got a right. He can eject him if he wants. I didn't do that. Not me. It's the way I got it. No way. The way it came from the factory. Well, if I get another one scuffed like that, you're gone. Hey, come on. Marty Barrett comes in and Cousins points to him as if say I'm not talking to you. And Bodiger says I ain't got nothing. So Ricky Henderson and leading off the inning after Bodiger had taken all his warm ups and he said wait a minute let me see the ball I'm supposed to hit. And Darrell Cousins found it scuffed. Henderson one for three it's three runs three hits for the Red Sox. No run, seven hits for the Yankees. The Yankees have left nine. Bob Stanley and left-hander Tom Bolton throwing in the Red Sox bullpen. Strike. Clyde King examining the ball, and he hands it to Chris Shambliss, the batting coach. Off speed, the spinner missed. One and one. Red Sox with one in the first, two in the seventh. I tell you, it's not the scuff ball that's got the Yankees. It's those base on balls they gave up. One and one. Big, slow, roundhouse curveball. One and two. When we were kids playing here in New York, we take a tennis ball and cut it in half, turn it inside out, and scale it, and you could get some of the action that he gets on throwing that. That is really some trick, isn't it? It is. He starts it right at the hitter, hoping they give up, and they've been giving up. And that's not a give up. It's a line drive single to center. So Henderson singles, opening up the seventh inning. Hit number eight for the Yankees, who have not been retired in order, and Joe Morgan is going out to the mound. 
it seemed like Henderson had made up his mind that he was just going to try to send that ball back up the middle. He really didn't swing that hard, and Morgan has made up his mind he's going to make a pitching change. So Mike Bodiger has them take the ball away when Henderson was coming up, and now makes a pitch with the new ball, and they take the game away. However, he goes out leading in the seventh inning. And he can't lose, leading by three and only one base runner his responsibility. Tom Bolton, young left-hander, will go head-to-head -head with Claudel Washington and Don Mattingly. And what a contrast it'll be between Bolton and Bodiger and that lattice work, the shadows from the light standards, will certainly help. As you can see, home plate is now completely in shadow. Lattice work there, and that makes it a bit tough when that pitcher's in the bright sunlight, and you have those shadows to contend with. Washington is grounded to short, grounded to second, and then popped up to Boddicker when he was really handcuffed on a slow curveball. Claudel hitting 316. Ball one. The paid attendance today, 51,392. And in this extremely frustrating year for the Yankees, the second highest attendance in the club history. The Yankees, with this big crowd today, have gone over the two and a half million mark. One and oh to Claudel Washington. And there goes Henderson. Ground ball up the middle. Base hit. So Henderson to third, Washington at first, and the tying run comes to the plate in Don Mattingly. So that Claudel Washington in his own way has had quite a year for these Yankees. Big stolen bases, big home runs, big base hits. They're set up now. Ricky was going to steal that base. Fastball right down the middle. So Tom Bolden is from Nashville Tennessee is up to his hips with more than country music now first and third nobody out and Mattingly at the plate. Don Mattingly has grounded out twice to first and lined a single so he's kept Benzinger busy all three at bats. One ball no strike. One reason the Red Sox are in front is that Joe Morgan knows I can bring in my left hander Bolden I can come back with Stanley and I can eventually come with my ace Lee Smith. Lee Smith yet to throw a ball in the Red Sox bullpen has 28 saves. One and to Mattingly. Big curve and a great save by Gedman. That's a wild pitch and a run otherwise. So young Bolden is struggling. Two balls and no strikes. Or you could go one more step, Ben. That ball gets by him. You lose your chance for the double play. That's right. Not only the run scoring, but Washington easily at second base. Nobody out. Two and oh. Fastball lifted back a third. Could be a tough play. A trio of socks. It's going to fall. Bouncing into the stand for the ground rule double. So now the tying run Mattingly is at second base with Washington at third. And nobody out. Looked like Mattingly was fighting off a tough pitch and hit it right off the end of the bat. And with enough English on it, when it hits, it just bounces right into the stands. Watch it. Fair by a long shot, and it just takes off. No way you can keep that from going into the stands. So the run is charged to Mike Boddicker. And now with runners at second and third and nobody out in the seventh, the Red Sox holding on to what has turned out to be a very shaky three to one lead. And Tom Bolden is going to be lifted. Bob Stanley comes steaming in from the bullpen. Bob Stanley who has been with the Red Sox since 1977 and has been strictly a relief pitcher really since 1981. 
He has inherited quite a spot. Second and third, nobody out. Three to one in favor of Boston. And Dave Winfield, who has walked in single twice at the plate. Now, Winfield wouldn't give you a nickel for either single today. He won some RBIs. Last night, his plate was full several times, and he left seven runners. Now he's been given another golden opportunity. And he lifts a fly ball down the right field line, slicing foul into the seats out of play on one. You know, to be Bob Stanley inheriting this kind of a burden facing a hitter like Winfield, you really have to have a, a good sense of humor. Earlier this year, they had an aerial photo of Fenway Park, and they were asking the players to put their signatures according to their position. And he signed his name outside where the Massachusetts Turnpike was because he said, that's where my home runs go. You wonder how a guy can live diffusing bombs. You better keep it light. Breaking ball grounded to the right side that gets a run over. That's the first out of the inning. Washington scores. Now the tying run is 90 feet away in Mattingly at third, much to the delight of this large crowd of 51,392. And Jack Clark, the batter. Washington's run is charged to Bolton. Mattingly at third belongs to Bolton. But the one thing that Stanley's thinking right here is strikeout. That's what's going to. He's going to have to come up with that because they're playing back. They're going to give the run. Look out behind him off the glove of Gedman. Here comes the tying run. Talk about unexpected. I mean, Gedman had no chance. That ball would look like it was way behind Clark. I don't know. I don't think it was a fastball because it didn't knock Clark down. He's kind of ducked it. Boy, was that wild. It's like a sidearm curveball. Nothing. I mean, he went down all right, but it wasn't a knockdown. I mean, like a hard fastball is what I'm saying. And it was behind him, behind so it was a him. dangerous area, too. Yes, it was. It was a sidearm pitch. It, he just missed it by, by a mile. Well, the Yankees have scored three in the seventh inning to tie it up. 1-0 and to Clark. Breaking ball fouled off. 1-1. One and one. It is needless to say. A wild pitch. The wildest pitch this side of Barnum and Bailey. It has not been a hitter's day by any means. You realize we have a total of six runs. Two have scored on ground balls. One scored on a walk. And one scored on a wild pitch. The base on balls. And that, that's just what Stanley just did. It, you know, it, it's just bad pitching. Two and two. To look ahead when the Sox come up in the eighth inning, Benzinger, Burks, and Reed. So Boddicker's good work for six innings plus goes down the drain. He's not involved in this one. And neither is Clark. He's caught looking. Boy, what a day. Second time the Jack has struck out. Like a just a good hard sidearm fastball. Watch it go. And he apparently thinking it's outside. So Clark, all he can do is sit and wait for the next time as he sits next to Mattingly and checking in is Pagliarulo. Well one. So you realize if Stanley doesn't uncork that wild pitch. He's got a chance to get out of it. But the wild pitch wrecked the inning for him and it's a 3-3 tie. And that's fouled away. On one. Three runs, ten hits for the Yankees. Three runs, three hits for the Red Sox. That's on the corner for a strike. And the count one and two. There it is. The Yankees who had left nine in six innings finally break through to get even. 
Breaking ball takes care of Pagliarulo. However, the damage cannot be undone. Three runs, three hits, and we're all even at three. It was opening day at Fenway Park. Alan Trammell of the Detroit Tigers facing the new member of the Red Sox, Lee Smith, and Trammell won it with a game-winning home run. In Boston, they were bitterly disillusioned, but they didn't have to wait till next year because Lee Smith, with his 28 saves, has become a mainstay of the Boston bullpen and might still figure prominently. You know, it's interesting that Bob Stanley uncorks that wild pitch here in New York. Maybe you remember the World Series when he entered game six in the last of the 10th inning with two out and two on to face Mookie Wilson. The count went to two and two and he threw an inside wild pitch that tied the score and then Mookie Wilson hit that famous ground ball that went through Buckner's legs for the Mets win. So for. Bob Stanley nightmare revisited in New York. Lou Pinella, after having his left hander, Hippolito Pena, get to the mound, will be called in. So Pena is being lifted. Larry Parrish comes out of the Red Sox dugout, and Pinella will go to the bullpen that has been such a heartache for him this year. A 3-3 tie in the eighth inning. The Yankees trying to stay afloat and the Red Sox trying to bury him here in the stadium. Certainly the Yankee pitching has been terrific in allowing the Sox only three hits. However the Yankees have allowed eight walks Things were going swimmingly for the Boston Red Sox for a while. The Yankees now have tied it up and they go to the horse. Dale Mohorsik. Been almost like uh, fan appreciation day at the ballpark where they give away a lot of gifts. Both teams have really gifted each other uh, based on balls. Uh, Red Sox got runs and then that wild pitch turns out to be the big one for the Yankees. We're all tied up here. Todd Benzinger giving way to Larry Parrish, so Hippolito Pena giving way to Dale Mohorsik. Remember in Fenway Park, the way they pitched Parrish was just that breaking ball, keeping it down where a breaking ball should be. Didn't give him a fastball to hit, just kept going for that outside corner. Parrish has had two pinch hit appearances for Boston this year, and he's two for two. Well, one. Mohorsik is backed up by Neil Allen in the bullpen. Parrish has a half a dozen home runs with the Red Sox. Takes a strike. One and one. Three three in the eighth. Parrish Burks Reed. Try to keep that ball away from him. They don't want him to get that ball inside. He let one get away then. I'll tell you he two. did. He <laughs> really let that one get away. That was a mistake. Uh oh. Time for the moment. The fan coming out picking this moment to talk to Don Mattingly. So now he's going to talk to Winfield. As we get on to more important things, you know, one frustrating thing when you think about the Boston Red Sox this year. They have a chance to win 96 games. That's if they win them all between now and the end of the year. Twice they won more than that and lost to the Yankees. In 1977, the Red Sox won 97 games and still finished two and a half back of the Yankees. In 78, they won 99 and lost in the playoff. And if you want to go way back, in 1949 they lost on the final day despite the fact they had a brilliant record. The Red Sox of 1949 were even tougher at home than this year's club. They won 61 games out of 77 at home amid ground ball wide a third and off balance throw got him anyway boy he didn't have much on it because it was off balance and he hurt himself in twisting to make the throw. 
That uh, ball was inside and he was able to hit it to the left side and Pagliarulo mm -hmm. really roams far to his left. Watch how far over he has to go but where he hurts himself is because he's got to throw off balance and Gene Monahan's going to go out there. He is completely off balance. He throws off that front foot and you can see right there he pulls something behind his right leg and they're going to check on it. That was quite a play man. It sure was. Lou Pinella is coming out of the dugout with Burks and Reed do up. He wants to make sure his third baseman is able to play and I don't think so. Well I was going to say because we were, you remember Burks uh, tried to bunt he bunt it down the first base side but with Pagliarulo limping off uh, had he stayed in the game I wouldn't have been surprised to see Burks try to beat one out but he's leaving. So Mike Pagliarulo makes a brilliant effort to get Larry Parrish but really had to pay the bill. Pagliarulo by the way was not going to come up because he made the last out in the seventh inning. To all you folks who have been watching the Oakland Milwaukee Brewers game welcome to Yankee Stadium. I'm Ben Scully along with Joe Garagiola. The Red Sox got a run in the first and two in the seventh to lead the Yankees three nothing. The Yankees had left nine men in six innings. But in the seventh inning the Yankees had three consecutive hits to get close. Bob Stanley committed a wild pitch and Mattingly scored and that tied it all up. Now in the eighth inning of this three three tie Larry Parrish batted for Todd Benzinger and Pagliarula made a good play on him but he pulled a muscle. Looked like a hamstring on the right leg. And Luis Aguayo will have to take over at third base for Pagliarulo. Oakland defeating Milwaukee 5 to 2. And in this one, very much up in the air. 3 3 in the eighth inning. Would you test Aguayo? A thought. The only I don't know what kind of a bunt of Burks is. He did try to bunt once, he but he pushed, he pushed it the other it, way. Pushed it the other way, but uh, nothing else. I think I would drop my hands up that fat handle, mm -hmm. take a strike, and just put the thought in Aguayo's mind. I know one thing. I sure would have tested Pagliarulo. Oh yeah. Well, one. The Yankee pitchers today: Richard Dotson, followed by Steve Shields, Hippolito Pena, and now Dale Mahorsik. In there, the Red Sox pitchers, Boddicker, Bolton, and Stanley. Wouldn't bite after that breaking ball, two and one. Red Sox with three hits. They had a single by Barrett in the first inning, a double by Romero in the fifth. And on one hit, they scored twice in the seventh. Two and two. One other note for those who have just joined us big crowd here, 51,392, seeing if there is anything left to the Yankee hopes. Two balls, two strikes. Half swing, down he goes. Fastball on the hand. I think it was a foul tip. You could see that uh, Cousins kind of clipped his hands, which it looked like on the half swing he clipped it. Let's see. At least he gave that sign. Watch he played umpire as he, he gives the sign. Yep, there it was. He clipped it. So Burks is done with two out in the eighth inning. Jody Reed, the batter. Reed walked, grounded out, and then sacrificed. All for one. Right. When the Yankees bat in the bottom of the eighth inning, they have Willie Randolph, Don Slaught, and Rafael Santana. One ball, one strike. Two and one to count. Three 
Eighth inning, two out, bases empty. Beaten foul on the count, two balls, two strikes. Final game of the series tomorrow between these two, and it'll be Rick Roden and Roger Clemens. The Sox have beaten the Yankees four straight, and going head to head, have beaten them eight out of 11. Two and two. Out of the way. I realize it's very hard for Yankee fans to think there is any hope left, but there is, especially the fact that Boston has to play Toronto. You know, Toronto has beaten the Red Sox eight out of ten, swept four in Boston earlier this year. So they are a formidable foe, especially going head to head with Boston. So this a very, very big game. Two and two. Ground ball to shortstop. Santana. All right, the eighth inning, the top half in the books at the end of seven and a half. A three-three tie. Larry Parrish, who batted for Todd Benzinger, stays in the game and plays first base. And in the bottom of the eighth inning, Willie Randolph, Don Slaught, and Rafael Santana against Bob Stanley. Ball one. Randolph today hit by a pitch, grounded out and struck out, 0 for 2. Breaking ball strike, 1 and 1. One ball, one strike, 3-3, three, three, bottom of the eighth. Checked as he tried to get out of the way of it. Fielded by Parrish, who's going to do it himself. The old story, anytime you don't have to throw the ball, don't throw it. One away. The so Randolph just trying to get out of the way of a pitch up and in. And that ball was really riding into where it tied up Randolph, and uh, much like Claudel Washington earlier, he just couldn't break out of the box. So here's Don Slaught, foul to third, single to right, and single to center. For those who joined us a little late in this 3-3 tie, the most important thing to note is the lack of an attack for either side. That's popped in the air back a third down the line. Reed and Romero. Reed. And we have two down. There have been six runs scored today in this 3-3 tie. Two runs scored on ground balls. One scored on a walk. And one scored on a wild pitch. So it has been anything but a hitter's day. The starting pitchers, in fact, the game is now in the hands of Mahorsik and Stanley. It means Dotson, Shields, Pena, Boddicker, and Bolton have nothing to do with it. Here's Santana. Popped up, looped a double to left and struck out. A chopper up the middle, going to his right and handling the big hop as Barrett to get him, and the Yankees tiptoe out of the eighth inning. And at the end of eight, a 3-3 tie. The Yankees. We go to the ninth inning. Three runs, three hits for the Red Sox. Three runs, ten hits for the Yankees. The Sox scored one in the first and two in the seventh. The Yankees scored three in the bottom of the seventh. Bob Stanley committing a wild pitch to get Mattingly home to tie up the game. Now in the ninth inning. Dale Mohorsik will be pitching to Rich Gedman, Ed Romero, and Wade Boggs. By the way, heartiest congratulations to the Oakland Athletics' Dave Stewart. Dave picked up his 20th win today in beating Milwaukee. Sure hope that the injury to Bob Ojeda really, that was so sad to read. Heartbreaking. And Bobby's suffering the injury to the middle finger of his left hand. And of course, that's a vital digit for any kind of a pitcher, especially a finesse pitcher, although the post operative reports seem to be highly optimistic for next year. I sure pray so. Yeah, we sure do. Where's well, Gedman grounded out, popped up and single. Ball one. Three three in the ninth. 
Edmund Romero and Bog. And that's hit to right center. And Winfield not running very well. And that's up against the wall. And Gedman is going to be into second base with a double. And we should explain that. In the seventh inning, Rich Gedman looped a single to right, and Winfield charging it suffered a hyperextension of his left knee. Not enough to take him out of the game, but you could see it was obvious that he was unable to run very well, as Kevin Romine will now run for Rich Gedman. See Winfield very gingerly on that leg. There really has to be something wrong with him for uh, Winfield to do that because he's an all out player. Well when we saw the hyperextension I marveled over the fact that he was able to continue. Here's the play for the benefit of those who are watching the Oakland Milwaukee game watch his left leg right there there see it buckle that hyperextension of that left knee. So he's really biting a bullet out there in right field and. He is due to be the fourth batter when the Yankees come up in the bottom of the ninth inning. Even on the picture, Vin, you almost think that it's trick photography the way he rolls over like that. But he stayed in the game. There he is. When the Yankees bat in the bottom of the ninth, they have Ricky Henderson, Claudel Washington, and Don Mattingly. And then if anybody gets on, it will be up to Winfield. Mattingly is going to talk to Mahorsik because you've got to believe that Romero is going to bunt that ball and make sure they get him over and Mattingly is going to be charging as hard as he can. And the question is what kind of a bunter is Romero. He has sacrificed once this year. He hasn't had that very many at bats anyway. First thing to do is to give Kevin Romine something to think about. Take a step away from him at second base. He's got to be careful of the pickoff. Santana's right behind him. There's the bunt. Oh, he laid that down like he really knew. And it's safe at third because it had to be a tag over there. And it wasn't really close. We have to assume that Mahorsik was following the directions of either Slot or Mattingly. You won't know until you ask about that, but with the, the way he threw that ball, it's almost like he had his mind made up. If I come up with it, I'm going to third base. He didn't hesitate at all. And here comes Lou Pinella again with first and third. And Wade Boggs coming up. Aguayo down to handle a throw, but Romine was in there easily. It was well, a very good bunt, by the way. You see where well, he Romero he just, laid that. That's right. Down. He laid it right down. That grass being a bit high slowed it down. Mahorsi came off the mound thinking he had a play, but it wasn't even close. Tell you that so little, Pinella making his move. That little bunt has really worked for Joe Morgan today, and it looks like we're going to have a pinch hitter coming out of that bench, and look who it is. And Lee Guterman will be called in from the Yankee bullpen as Jim Rice begins to loosen up. So the batter do up is Wade Boggs and they bring in a left hander. We should also explain why Boggs would be batted for as Mohorsik sits down and thinks about the frustration of fielding that bunt and going to third. Then Joe Morgan just called his third base coach over there and is going to have a conference uh, in the dugout right now with him. So the wheels are spinning here at Yankee Stadium as Lee Guterman, the left hander, comes in to pitch to Boggs. And Morgan does the unexpected and hits for Boggs. For the Dodgers, this Yankee. Ball club letting them get away. Looking at the other clubs who are on their way, the Dodgers, Oakland, and the Mets, they have a great deal of confidence in their bullpen, but not the Yankees. Now you can see him make the change here, but the double play, Rice hits the ground ball. You got the double play, you're still going to get the run, but I don't know. Boggs can put that ball in play. It's it's one of those things that 
And strategy is a perspective, it's opinion. Joe Morgan has to make the decision, and obviously he's made it. And you sit here and you wonder, what would you do right now if you were him? That's the question. There are two things also, two pebbles to drop in the pond. One is that Wade Boggs was the designated hitter today because he fouled a ball off his right instep and did not have any movement at all. He could run straight ahead. So Morgan was aware that Boggs could very easily hit the ball back to somebody and they could get two outs. He plays the percentages with Jim Rice and hopes to avoid the double play. The other question is, and we do not have the sources, but how many times have the Red Sox pinch hit for Wade Boggs? I mean, we're talking about one of the greatest hitters that ever right. played the game. And, and Rice is a a double play man. I mean, I don't think that's a factor at all as, as far as taking box out of there. I really don't. Against left handers, Boggs hitting 329. So if you ever want to sit down and, and have a bucket full of questions, this is the perfect time. Wade Boggs hitting 329 against left handers, going out for a pinch hitter. Admittedly, he has a sore foot, but the guy coming up to replace him. Lead the American League and grounding into double play. What, what a situation. There's a million things you could think about. You know, you, you certainly eliminate the squeeze play with the uh, rice up there. And then there you see Wade Boggs. So I'll tell you. You might also say, well, uh, Jim Rice is a strong man, a fly ball hitter. OK. Jim Rice has six scoring fly balls. Wade Boggs has seven. And it's late in the game. Box has been batting at least. Rice is not. There's all kinds of things you can think about, but hey, you can talk from now until Christmas Eve. What they do, Guterman and Rice, that's what really counts. And that's what's so great about it. We can all get into this situation because we can all take sides. So Guterman pitching in the ninth inning with runners at first and third, nobody out. And Rice at the plate in a 3-3 tie. 4-1. Yeah, I was just thinking, after all this, and then he hits him or something. In the <laughs> Standing at third, Ed Romine. Uh, Kevin Romine running for Rich Gedman. Ed Romero moved him over there with the sacrifice. 2-0. and oh. And Boggs, boy, oh, I wish I had it at my fingertips because I'm sure you're wondering, when was the last time they pinch hit for him? Probably on a playground. <laughs> Two balls, no strikes. Ground ball smothered at short. No play at the plate. The throw to first for the out, but the run is over. And Rice almost wedged it into left field. Santana makes a good play, and he really thought he might have a chance for a play at the plate, but Romine, it was a contact play. As soon as that ball was hit, he broke. Look at here. He gets that ball behind him. I'm watching him look towards the plate, and he sees no, no chance, and so he goes to first base and gets Jim Rice. That run is charged to Dale Mohorsik. The best guess, and I'm sure they're trying to go through the pages, Dick Bresciani of Boston said he thinks the last time that they ever had a hitter pinch hitting for Wade Boggs would be in his rookie year of 1982, maybe. They have to really do some digging to find out. All right, one out. It is four to three Boston in the ninth inning. Marty Barrett now trying to get Romero home from second. And then after Barrett, Dwight Evans. The Yankees have used Dotson, Shields, Pena, Mohorsik, and Guterman. Fouled away. Joe Morgan, low key and all that, but he's made two pinch hitting moves that has told the whole world, especially his ball club, I am the manager. He took Jim Rice out and sent somebody up the bunt, and now he takes the world's leading hitter out, not the American League, the world's leading hitter, and pinch hits for him. Who's the boss? That tells you the only man in this century six times to have over 200 hits and he wasn't good enough to go up there and hit in that spot in that spot <laughs> in the eyes of his manager. And there's the hit batter. It's Barrett who gets plunked. And I'd be willing to bet 
that if they ask Joe Morgan why, he's going to say, well, it was 6-2 and even that he'd do something, which is a favorite expression of his, whatever that means. For Lou Pinella, it is another frustrating moment in the ninth inning as Gudeman trying to get Barrett nails him and now with two on and one out Dwight Evans the batter Evans has been kept in check today three ground balls walked in the seventh inning when he walked it was with the bases loaded he picked up an RBI Pinella has made all the moves but hardly any of them have worked right so Romero at second Barrett at first one out in the ninth inning Red Sox four Yankees three chopper to the right side Randolph will try to tag the runner and then he does not have a play at first it was a pretty good heads up play by Marty Barrett not to run into the tag he knew what Randolph had in mind. That's one of the things you wonder what a first base coach does and most of the times is ask the pitcher if he needs a jacket or tell a guy not to take a lead. That's what you remind the runner of. Don't run into the double play and Marty Barrett just stops long enough and allows Evans to get the first base and keep that inning alive. Now runners at first and third. Good play by Barrett. He gets fives all around in the dugout. Red Sox at the corners and here is Mike Greenwell. Walked intentionally, struck out, robbed of a hit by Mattingly, and lifts one to right center and deep. Washington going back and takes her in. But the Red Sox take in a run. One run. The key was Gedman's double to lead off the inning. One hit and two left. So the Red Sox leaving eight men in nine innings, lead 4-3. And now to the bottom of the ninth inning. With Ricky Henderson, Claudell Washington, and Don Mattingly. And interestingly enough, Lee Smith is trying to save this for Bob Stanley, who wild pitched the tying run over. So go the fortunes of relief pitches. Rick Cerrone is behind the plate, and Kevin Romine is now in left field. So Kevin Romine will fight the sun in left field. And you can put Rick Cerrone behind the plate. So Cerrone will go in Greenwell's spot. Ricky Henderson, single to the hole at short on a check swing. Grounded out, flied out, and singled up the middle in the seventh inning and scored a run. Darryl, Henderson two for four. Darrell Cousins having some problems with that mask working on it. Well, you better have your oh, mask in working with order <laughs> with Lee Smith pitching. Well, he throws, uh, chances are you're going to get a lot of foul tips. Lee Smith's ratio is almost three to one. 91 strikeouts and 32 walks. Well, the big guy ready. How big? 6'6, 245 pounds. Or one. You don't have any idea how big that is when a guy's pitching off a high mound like that. Ugh. Four runs, four hits for the Red Sox. Trying to get the maximum from the minimum. Breaking ball, and he's behind 2 0. Oh. The Yankees, three runs, 10 hits. Two and zero to Henderson. He's behind three and zero. The Lee Smith, not only in danger of walking somebody, but in danger of turning a rabbit loose here in the bottom of the ninth. One guy you don't want up there. He can turn a walk into a triple. In there. Henderson. Has had 79 walks in his leadoff role and 86 stolen bases. In there again. 
Henderson taking all away, trying to get on. So three and two to Ricky. Foul late and foul off to the right upstairs. 51,392, and they have seen a dandy here at Yankee Stadium. On the heels of what figured to be anticlimactic after the Red Sox won that scramble last night, 10 9, this one's come back a beauty. Three balls, two strikes. Wall four, and there's a rabbit on the prowl. Henderson does what he wants to do, get on, not even close, high and inside, and we'll see a few throws at first base. Tough man to pitch to anyway, the way he crouches at the plate, and that's the first hitter that Lee Smith looks at. So now you have the tying run at first, nobody out. Washington, Mattingly, and Winfield do up. Romero on the grass. There goes Henderson. The pitch gets away from Cerrone. Henderson doesn't know it. He went in head first. Now he's heading for third. He's there. He turned that walk into a triple. It looked like Cerrone might have been crossed up because when the ball went off his glove, he kind of hesitated before he broke back, and Henderson on a straight steal goes in head first, and Cerrone looked like he might have had a play at third base, but not even a throw. Watch this now. Right there, now he's, he kind of hesitates, and Henderson goes in head first. He wants to get the second. He doesn't realize what's happened. Now he sees it, and he's a little bit undecided, and then he finally says, I'm going. Here's why I thought he'd draw a throw, man. It'll be a stolen base on a wild pitch. 0 oh and 1. Remember last week we were talking about when you catch a game, who don't you want on the Yankees to get on? That's the guy right there, and there's the very reason. Now, Mattingly in a windfield can't hit the home run, but you walk them, and that's pretty much where they stay, not with Henderson. 1 and 1, a count to Claudel Washington. Nobody out, bottom of the ninth, 4 3 Boston. fly ball deep to left field back goes Romine away back it's off the wall in comes Henderson Washington the second in a brand new ball game Dell, another big hit. Fastball out over the plate, and he drives it hard to the opposite field. Romine thinks he's going to make a play just over his head. He had room, but he had been playing in a little bit. Three new players have all been burned. Lee Smith, the first batter was Henderson, and he walked him. Rick Cerrone, the new catcher, had to chase a wild pitch. And Kevin Romine, a new left fielder, had to go to the wall and couldn't flag it. So they'll walk Mattingly intentionally. And the guy who almost wrecked his left leg, Dave Winfield, will be coming up with the game on the line. And the hungriest hitter for the Yankees coming up. On deck, Jack Clark. Last night, the hungriest hitter was Dave Winfield. Winfield left seven men on. Now he's got a bad leg. We know that. Joe Morgan knows it. Everybody in Yankee Stadium knows it. You know it. You saw him hyperextend the left leg. Would you ask Winfield to sacrifice? I would not know. The answer is he has not sacrificed all year. And Jack Clark on deck. I think if you, you ask him to bunt, you're losing probably two hitters, him and Clark. So two on, nobody out. They're trying to bird dog the runner, Washington. He's the winning run at second base. 
Putting the squeeze on him is Marty Barrett and Jody Reed, but especially Barrett. I'll tell you, man, regardless of how this game goes, it's a real tribute to this Yankee ball club, the way they have battled back and battled back because they had every reason in the world to say, hey, that's it. Yeah, last night was one of those, hey, that's it game, but it's still alive here. One ball and no strikes to Dave Winfield, trying to win it here in the bottom of the ninth inning against Lee Smith. center Claudel Washington is going to tag Ellis Burks no it's Evans to take the ball away from him the throw to third not in time down to second goes Mattingly boy what a clutch throw by Evans however he knew he had the angle and he made a one hopper but someone running as well as Washington was able to beat it but it was a gutsy throw yes it was and look at Burks makes it it's not even a play but watch Evans he looks to see where Burks is and Burks wanted to take it and Evans takes it and he really unparks a tremendous throw but Washington had tagged up the minute that ball was hit I'll tell you that was a good throw all right, we were talking about hungry hitters. Clark will remain hungry. They'll take the bat right out of his hands and walk him intentionally. The second intentional walk and the third walk in the inning. Ken Phelps, the left-hand hitter, is out on deck. Though Phelps would hit for Pagliarulo in a moment with the bases loaded. You're seeing the reason that uh, you wouldn't bunt with Winfield uh, because you'll, you'll do exactly that, although you know, it served the same purpose, but Winfield tried to knock that run in. And, of course, the only thought you'd even have of the bunt sure. is the fact he's got that bad leg. That's all. So the bases are loaded. One out in the ninth, a 4-4 tie, and this big crowd beside itself as Ken Phelps comes up. <laughs> Then they got to play everybody in, infielders, outfielders. They got to go to the plate to get that double play. Phelps, 0 for 1 last night, struck out as a pinch hitter. Talking about fastball pitcher, fastball hitter. Ken Phelps, who was obtained by the Yankees from Seattle in the exchange for Jay Buhner and Rick Balabon and a minor league player. Really playing to pull Marty Barrett way over, almost next to Parrish. A lot of room up the middle. So the infield is up. Washington, Mattingly, and Clark on the lines. Outfield's up. Everybody's up. One ball and no strikes. If you're thinking about scoring fly balls, Phelps has three. One is a Yankee. Tell you, he'll not hit a sacrifice fly because they're so tight. No way they can score. One ball and no strikes. Birch is almost like that roving outfielder in softball. Simone going out to talk to Smith. You have to play tight like that. Four runs, four hits for the Red Sox. Four runs, 11 hits for the Yankees. The Yankees left nine men in the first five innings. That's Trying to get down. one home with everybody up. One and oh. One ball and one strike to count. Phelps was hitting 266. Only in the 220s as a Yankee. Eight of his 22 home runs as a Yankee. One and one. Two balls and one strike. Phelps, the sixth man to come up. The Sox leading with their ace, Lee Smith, and undaunted, the Yankees scramble for the tying run, and now they're trying to win it. 4-4, bottom of the ninth, 
Bases loaded, one out, two balls, and one strike. On the corner, Claudel Washington, 90 feet away from a win. That close. Two and two. Off the rubber. It's simply a case it just didn't feel right to him, that's all. High foul off third. Romero watches it go out of play along with Sharon. Morgan and Pinella sweating it out, but especially Pinella. The Yankees who appeared to be doomed down 3 nothing, going to the bottom of the seventh inning, especially on the heels of last night's 10 to 9 defeat. But they scrambled to tie, lost the lead again in the ninth inning, tied in the bottom of the ninth. And now it's the Yankees trying to win it. One out, two and two to Ken Phelps. Got him looking. Huh? Fastball outside part to plate. He just couldn't pull the trigger. No doubt about this pitch being a strike. It's a long way from that plate, like he's looking for a pitch inside, but I mean, it is right down, right down the center of that plate. So two out, ninth inning, a thoroughly frustrated Ken Phelps. And the batter is Willie Randolph, who is 0 for 3, has not hit a ball hard. Struck out, grounded to short, grounded to first. Was hit by a big, slow Boddicker curveball back in the second inning. A strike. So Big Lee Smith meeting the issue head on. Claudel Washington at third, Don Mattingly at second, Jack Clark at first. 0 and 1 to Randolph. 1 and 1. Randolph with 34 runs batted in this year. He was 0 for 3 last night. In his last seven games, he's really been struggling. In fact, he came into this game 2 for 20. 3 for 24. Well, he now has just three hits in his last 27 at bats. Fastball hit the shortstop. Reed kicks it. The game is over. from him and the Yankees with two in the ninth inning are the winners 5-4 look at this again Manningly I don't believe screening me just got caught in between hops in that right foot game and that was it well today's NBC Miller Lite player of the game is Claudel Washington Miller Lite happy to present a check for a thousand dollars in the name of Claudel Washington to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society the Yankees beat the Red Sox 5-4. But Joe Garagiola, Vin Scully saying so long from Yankee Stadium in New York.